Okay, we are live. All right, the video started. And now I've completely forgotten how I was gonna begin this. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> Hello everybody. This is kind of like a special Stitch and Bitch live show. We're gonna uh, be talking about the Hugo Awards shortlist that was announced, um, well, in my time zone, earlier <laughs> earlier this morning, um, a couple of hours ago. Uh, we have our usual Stitch and Bitch crew here today. We also have our guest, Kelsey. <laughs> I'm not usually part of this group because I do not do fiber crafts. <laughs> but but, but you enjoy like the results of them. I do. That yeah. you could do as part of like a stitch and bitch, like honor yeah. stitching. <laughs> someday, someday we'll get you on and you'll like make a hat. Well, I, I, I will have to, I, I have to learn how to crochet to crochet a hat for Esme with the book that my friend gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so someday I will, I will do a crochet. Yep. All right. We're going to go around and quickly introduce ourselves and then get down to business. So I will start with myself very quickly because we're on my channel. My name is Rachel. My channel obviously is Kalanadi and you probably know who I am because you are here already. Um, <laughs> That's why they on. Uh, Bree. <laughs> um, I'm Bree. My channel is Bree Reads Books. I do the science fiction fantasy thing and I knit. Ooh, is that a honeycomb? It is a honeycomb pattern. Oh, that's so pretty. Oh, pretty. It's very pretty. Oh my God, I love that. Nice. All right. Kelsey, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Kelsey. My channel is called The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. Um, and that's where you can generally find me wearing hats and talking about SFF books. Rhea? Uh, so I'm Rea from the channel uh, Book Fringe. I am joining all of you from Finland. My pronouns are they, them. And I generally talk about SFF books and manga and anime on my channel. So, yeah. Dai? Hi, I'm Diana. My channel is Bookish Dai. And like pretty much everyone else here, I also talk about SFF on my YouTube channel. And I apologize if you can hear a little squeaking in the background. One of my cats has found the, the toy that makes noise. And my pronouns are she, her, her, hers. Cool. It would not be a live show without a cat somewhere in the background. Yeah, I'm waiting for oh. one of them to crash. Our first cat. I've, I've got a floof. She's in my lap. This oh, is my God. <laughs> hey. oh. She's, She's just been <laughs> sitting I love Esme. She's the chillest She's cat in existence. Oh, what a cutie. <laughs> oh my. Um, I think we need to go ahead and right away unbury this lead. Yeah. Rachel got on the Hugo shortlist for fan cast. And oh, so Claire. So and quiet. So like, Claire. Yeah, Claire not just sometimes. I think she might come in later. Yeah, yeah. Claire, yeah. Claire said that she's going to come in later or potentially come in later because she's dealing with uh, potentially moving. There's like some like weird ambiguity in the situation because anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Rachel got on, on the short list. It's so exciting. Congratulations, Rachel. Yes, drinks. Toast. Please be off giving toast speech. <laughs> I'm not giving a speech. <laughs> How do you feel? Well, Congratulations. I'm feeling weirdly blase at the moment, mostly because I'm we so Can we also <laughs> just say our, our group talks basically every day, and Rachel did not say a No, piece. nothing. She did not like hint. She didn't say anything like sly with a wink. Nothing. <laughs> I think it wasn't even Rachel who suggested that we do this. This was something that like I like Raya, Bree, or I came I can't remember which one, but like one of the other members of our regular Stitch and Bitch was like, Oh hey, let do you guys want to do like a reaction live stream or something? And Rachel was like, Yeah, I could probably do that. <laughs> I'm <laughs> taking the day off of work. <laughs> I I have a day off in like 
for some reason in the middle of the week and we were like oh that's so, so it, was, nice. it, was, it was it was actually i was going to take tomorrow off completely because i get my my second vaccination shot tomorrow and i'm pretty sure i'm going to like feel terrible afterwards but i just moved it to this day because i got an email and i was like well <laughs> this is going to happen remember <laughs> the, remember the antihistamines the antihistamines so you won't feel so bad yeah. <laughs> Regardless, it's an amazing week then because not only are you a Hugo nominee officially, you are also vaccinated. Yeah, <laughs> which is very exciting. <laughs> and uh, also, I mean, we, we can all, don't all like uh, <laughs> I'm not giving a speech. I'm not giving a speech. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, also, every one of us can pat ourselves on the back now because we are actual friends with Hugo nominees now. Like, we have made it officially <laughs> by association. <laughs> I think I think in the future we're going to see a lot more booktubers on the, the fan cast list. At least I have my fingers crossed for that because it just it feels like it's finally happening and that's really yeah. exciting. So It is. I was telling Rachel and everyone, I said, that when we were on break, because we watched the actual announcements together, which is why I screamed in her ear, <laughs> um, that between then and now, all I could think of was in San Jose when we shared a hotel room and she made the long list. And I was like, one day you're going to make the short list, Rachel. It's going to happen. <laughs> I was like, no, no. <laughs> Also, I just somehow find it hilarious that when we were like uh, having like the, like listening in on the shortlist announcement, I was like 30 seconds in the future and I was screaming completely incoherently in, in everyone's ear and nobody was like, knew why. like, everyone was like, what the hell is happening? Also, we should say like, Claire is in the chat. Everyone else, so no. like everyone else was screaming before I even saw it, and then by the time I saw it, it was too late for me to scream, so I didn't get to scream. <laughs> so Claire's no, also no, in the chat, Claire. Claire and she is also is on the short list, and she's also amazing. It's Post. been great. Post. And jumping ahead a little bit, Conzielin Fringe made it to the best related yes. category. Yes. So congrats to Claire and everybody else on that one as well. It's just yeah, fantastic. that's like a double nomination. Yeah, <laughs> two for the uh, price of one. Oh, Anna says uh, I can show some of my crafts. It, you know, if I do actually go to Worldcon this year, it's going to be in December, which means I will be wearing a handmade sweater. You can bet on it. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, something I'm, fancy! I'm You'll have to make it specifically for that. Yeah, I'm sure I'll come up with something. <laughs> I mean, I, I, ah. <laughs> all right let's let's get into talking about the categories now so we're gonna go down the list as it's presented on the discon website so we're gonna start with the big one with the best novel category so i will read them and then we will talk about them so the novel nominees this year are black sun by rebecca roanhorse the City We Became by N.K. Jemison, Harrow the Ninth by Tamsin Moore, Network Effect by Martha Wells, Paranesi by Susanna Clark, and The Relentless Moon by Mary Robinette Kowal. And I'm, first of all, over the moon at basically all of this. <laughs> I think we can safely say that none of these is a surprise. Well, Harrow the Ninth is a little Yeah, little I was surprise actually a little surprised me. about Harrow just because I know Gideon was kind of polarizing. Like I I personally enjoyed Wait, Gideon. Gideon was I also last year. Yeah. 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 That's true. I also was really expecting um Mexican Gothic to be on the list. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I thought yeah. that that was gonna be like a shoe in for sure. Yeah, I was, was thinking that maybe maybe Harrow the Ninth could have been like probably a toss-up between Mexican Gothic and Harrow the Ninth. Maybe, yeah, um, maybe it would have like replaced Harrow the Ninth with Mexican Gothic for for my personal like. Yeah, I personally novelist. nominated Mexican Gothic instead of Harrow, um, but the, the shortlist is pretty similar to what I had put in. I'm really excited that Black Sun is there just because that was, huh. I think, my favorite novel last year. I'm, I'm super very excited, excited for Black Sun. Like, I'm, I'm excited, excited about it. 
I'm excited that the shortlist is the shortlist is giving me a reason to read Black Sun sooner than later because that's one that I really still want to get around to. Um, I will say just, if folks do audiobooks, the Black Sun audiobook is excellent. They have four different yeah. narrators for the four different like main POVs, and they all do such a great job. So like if you're on the fence about whether to like read it or listen to it, I highly recommend the audiobook. And aren't the audiobook narrators all indigenous as well? Yeah, they're also all indigenous. So oh, cool. Yeah. The thing I kind of like about the best novel category here, and also like, because there's a lot of crossover with the nebulas as well in this category, is they're all pretty much standalones or firsts in the series. Um, Cause yeah. somebody was saying before that Harrow the Ninth could probably be read on its own too. Yeah. Network and effect and the relentless. Yeah, the Relentless Moon. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah, that one's really self-contained, but you do have to kind of read the previous books to know what's been going on in the world. And the network effect, yeah. Mm -hmm. But both Murderbot and Lady Astronaut are also nominated in series, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm just really excited for Black Sun and Piranesi and also the City BBK because now I have an excuse to like, uh, what's the word? When you when you up something on your prioritize thing. prioritize yeah yeah that thing that word uh, for the city we became. Um, I really did enjoy Piranesi. It's so different from what Susanna Clark's done before that it was like, but also just super beautiful. I do think Black Sun is probably my favorite on the list, um, but. I'm halfway through Harrow, so I'll let you know. I'm pretty sure Black Sun is my I, I, I need to. I need to get Harrow from the library. Just not this month. Not this month. Yeah, um, my my reading for the next. I mean, I am glad that I am kind of glad that the Hugo's got pushed back to December, just because like I have not read most of the series, and so like my reading is going to be like way my reading is going to be way different over the next few months. I'm really okay. hoping that we'll have a longer period before voting ends because it would be great to take advantage of this time with everything being, everything being pushed up to December. Yeah. I okay. I'm going to, I'm going to answer a, a comment in the chat, which is the only real complaints I've seen about Black Sun all seem to really boil down to the fact that it doesn't stand on its own. And I actually disagree with this. I feel like the ending, which is the one thing in the book that tends to be polarizing and splits people, um, it is kind of fast, but it is very much foreshadowed throughout the whole book. And uh, if the ending had been any different, it wouldn't have had the same impact. And while it does have a hook for a potential sequel, which we know is probably going to come, um, I do think that it kind of does stand on its own because it does all of the things that it sets out to do, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but your your mileage may vary on that depending on what you look for in a standalone ending. For me personally, as someone who really hates cliffhangers and sort of that very cheap uh, sequel hook, for me personally, I would consider Black Sun to stand on its own for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. I have a question about thoughts on all nominees being women. I like it. I like it that it's also not all white women, which yes. I think yeah. last year it was the case where it was like all like all white women. Or like uh, I think I'll look you up lost the your short list. <laughs> Um, I, last year. I, I do I think it's phenomenal that we're out. getting much more diverse voices. I mean, if you look at the track record for how long we've had just, you know, predominantly almost exclusively like middle-aged yeah. white guys, like it's nice to have a change. Yeah, my, I my, agree. My partner and I were talking about this kind of like how it is with uh, Jordan Peele in horror movies where it's like, he he was saying that so much of what he does, he does because he's already seen the different version, right? The version with the white protagonist, the version with, you know, the predominant storyline being about a white character. And it kind of feels the same to me. Like I've read a lot of those books that come from, 
from um, that demographic, so, and it's nice. So from the uh, uh, the Hugo Awards, the best novel had all of the nominees were women, but there was uh, a lot of like LGBT representation. So mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Jane Anders, trans non-binary author, yeah. and uh, Tamsin Muir and Cameron Hurley, I think, are in the LGBT uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. spectrum as far as I know. And as far as they have said. It does look, Anna found something on the discount site that says, Voting is closing November 19, 2021. Okay, that's good. That's really good because like I said, I, I have not read most of the series and that's gonna be like a huge commitment to me. Look, this past mm. year has a, like affected a lot of people's reading really mm -hmm. negatively depending on you know how everyone's doing. So having, I, I think, you know, for me personally, I've read way fewer overall 2020 releases at this point in the year than I have in past years. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people. So having some extra time for the, the reading period for voting makes a lot of sense. Yes, yeah. especially with the library closures and lockdowns and stuff, yeah. it, it makes yeah. a lot of sense to extend the voting period. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I'm gonna... Alistair, I'm going to yeah, laugh. Yeah, Alistair, a bit. some of my best friends are middle aged white dudes. It's okay. You can read women too. Also, there are like, you know, decades of shortlists that you can read. In the sometimes, I, sometimes I start to think, like, who are my friends? And then I'm like, the middle aged white dudes are a definite minority in my friend group. It's like, it's like us queer folk flock together or something. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking if true, Raya. Uh, <laughs> no, but I will say, like, it. I I think this is, like, I would say the last couple of years, the Hugo shortlist has been really, really strong. And I think this is another example of the novelist being really, really strong. Like, I don't, like, for me, at least looking at the shortlist, there's no book there that I'm like, really? That one, like, there is for the Lodestar, which we will get to. Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, let's let's move on to best novella now. I do what a lore dot com um, category. Yeah, yeah, right. that's yeah. definitely how it feels. Yeah, holy um, crap. Shannon mentioned the Stone Weta, which I'm also disappointed didn't make make it. But this is one that I actually wonder if some people were really confused about whether it was a novel or a novella. I think mm -hmm. I actually nominated it as a novella and and didn't correct it on my ballot in time. Um, I, I'm really curious about the long list for that particular one because it was yeah. really wonderful. I'm... So the, the novella nominees, yes, they're all from tour <gasps> this year. Um, Come Tumbling Down by Sean and McGuire, The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Nivo, Finna by Nino Cipri, Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark, Riot Baby by Tochi Onyabuchi, and Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey. I oh. am very happy that both Riot Baby and Ring Chout made the list. Those were two that I was really hoping would make the list. They were, I read Riot Baby last year and I read Ring Chout this year, but those were two that I really loved. Um, mm. I am a little sad that the Four Profound Weaves didn't make it on the list just because like that that novella was just so lovely and oh, I it was still really want to read that that's on the endless list of things that I was hotly anticipating in the past year and didn't get around to because reading was terrible. Kelsey do you want to buddy read it with me it's so short I mean we could, yes we could try but... we could try and uh do do a buddy read to what's what that what's that word redeem to redeem our our previous failed attempts at buddy reading <laughs> um i can't highlight it but uh worlds and in ink was, is saying in the chat that they would have loved to have seen some of the tachyon novellas just to diversify diversify the publicist and i agree like mm -hmm. profound weaves was from tachyon and like i said i'm still a little bereft that that's not on the list just because it was just so moving and lovely and I felt I found it very like hopeful and healing. I just feel like Tor.com like they have such an obnoxiously pushy marketing that they just like like 
everyone just now associates novella with tor.com mm -hmm. like their marketing yeah. push has yeah. been like and yet places like tachyon huge. have been doing novellas regularly for years and years before tor so I also yeah. nominated Seven of Infinities, which is mm. the uh, Julia novella by Elliot de Bodard. And I Not like I thought it might this. have a chance because I think Tea Master got nominated. Mm, yeah. It was released. That's from Subterranean Press. Yeah. Um, but it, as far as I can tell, it hasn't gotten the level of, of hype and readership that Tea Master did. And I have no idea why, because I liked it a lot. I'm kind of actually surprised that like the the Shuya universe didn't make best series or was that nominated in a previous year recently? I, think it's well, I don't know if it, I don't know if it had an, I don't know. I think it was nominated in a previous year. I could be wrong. And if it was, it might not have enough word count this is true. to nominate it again. Because yeah. I know that's like the main thing is like how Shauna McGuire is able to like do it every year is her books are ridiculously long and she also does like a lot of short stories and novellas in those right. universes so that's how she's able to like, gosh like, darn the sh yeah i mean yeah um, subterranean press i think has a little bit of an issue where the buy-in for it is substantially higher than a lot of other novellas. Yeah. So even if yeah, they're putting out have... fantastic quality stuff, it's harder. Yeah. To yeah. I mean, yeah. even yeah. their ebook press is, is a specialty press. They're all about collector's editions. Mm -hmm. So are... they're different, different playing fields sometimes. Yeah. Are there ebooks also like only available in the U.S., not internationally? Mm -hmm. I, don't I don't think so. Know. I don't know, but I do find their ebooks to be. They're about like four or five dollars each, so they're not terribly pricey. I like, mean, specifically they, with Seven of Infinities, I know Elliot de Bodard like self-published her own UK uh, mm. release of Tea Master, and I don't know if she's also doing it with this one. So, um, I, from what I I gather, uh, sub presses ebooks are available through Amazon, but we don't stand Amazon ebooks in this household because <laughs> of the bloody DRMs. So, um, also, it looks like Anna is hmm. saying that they're not consistently out internationally. Mm. Yeah. Like, for example, Team right. Master and the Detective is out internationally, but then some of the others aren't. I think it depends I, on how I well think they're sold physically. I think there is um, an international ebook edition of Seven of Infinities that she self published, but I'm not. A hundred percent on that one. Yeah. Mm. Oh. But uh, but from what I've gathered, um, they 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 seem to be putting up the most sold physical editions as eBooks uh, on a larger market. Yeah. That would explain why Team Master and Detective is available internationally, uh, but some of the others that haven't had as big of a print run haven't been. Um, again, I can't oh, just speculation. Um, but a, a, a new Elise on Life was asking, is the Wayward series finally ending? It's not. Um, there is going to be a new novella next year. Um, I can't remember what the title is. I know, I think there's like a couple more novellas that have been sold to tour. I am a li like, I'm not ca caught up with that series. I'm a little surprised that they're still getting nominated every year with the series being this far in, I wouldn't have expected like that many people would be up to date with a series that's getting as long as it is. Um, but apparently there are. Die hard, die hard Shauna McGuire fans. <laughs> yeah, the Shauna McGuire stands are like serious, but also I think a lot of them because you can read them kind of in any order, mm -hmm. makes it really easy to pick up. And especially because they're really short, it's not the same as like reading a whole series of like full length novels. Mm -hmm. Like you're not asking me to commit to reading the entire 17 books in October day. Yeah, that um, one is going to be <laughs> like, and I mean, I'm saying this as someone who is a big October day fan and who nominated that for best series. Like mm -hmm. I do think that one is a little bit at a disadvantage, especially when you look at the series that have been completed. So like the David Bod trilogy, the burning got the um, Poppy war series, the interdependency series like i think it is going to be a little bit at like it is going to be at a disadvantage in terms of like how people are going to be consuming the best series 
Um, but I do think like as a series, the October Day books are very good. Um, but I'm, I think that's also jumping ahead a little. A I'm just personally very, like I'm lukewarm about the Wayward Children series anyway. Like I'm, I don't think that I'm going to be reading this one because I've, I've, I've read the first one and DNF the second one. So I'm just like, I, I think you're not, they can be a little hit or miss. I will say I really, really liked the Goblet Market one. I thought that one was pretty phenomenal. Um, I liked the first one. Some of the others in between, I you know could go either way on. Yeah. I haven't read Come Tumbling Down yet, though. Yeah, I haven't read that one either. But I, from these, I have read The Empress of Salt and Fortune, which I loved. So Am I much. correct that Empress of Salt and Fortune is not on the Nebula shortlist? Because I think that surprised me and I like suddenly mm. got worried that it wasn't going to end up on the Hugo shortlist, but then I, I was relieved it's, because it was. Of, of all the, like, this is such a good novella shortlist. I'm pull, I'm I'm pulling pulling I wish I made it. Right but now. The Empress of Salt yeah, and Fortune. Yeah, I'm going to pull up the Nebula list. list. Yeah, it, so it wasn't on there for profound. So for the Nebula shortlist, there was more variety in terms of the publishing. So the ones on the shortlist for the Nebula that aren't on the tour or on the Hugo shortlist are Tower of Mud and Straw, um, Ife Ayuku, The Tale of, um, am I did, I'm sorry, am I, The Tale of Emma de Yunu, uh, Bon, I'm sorry, I'm completely butchering that title. And then the Four Profound Weaves. So um, Empress of Salt and Fortune and Come Tumbling Down. And there was another one that I'm completely blanking on that didn't make the short list. I, I will admit that I haven't even watched the Nebula. I, I only know the Nebula shortlist as it pertains to best novel. And otherwise, I've been just out of the loop with the whole thing. I think it's the fiction think, categories. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting to see how much over time kind of is reflected from the Nebulas and the Hugos. Yeah. But I mean, they have such different roles in kind of what the community is recognizing that mm -hmm. I think that in and of itself, like where do professionals and kind of the broader fandom agree like this was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I will say though, I wouldn't have put Finn up by Nino Cipri on the list. I know I seem to be a minority that I hated that novella. I really enjoyed it. I'm really looking into the the sequel as well. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a little bit surprised in the sense that I I thought there might it maybe wouldn't make the shortlist, but I still thought it was quite good. So. I mean, I am I'm going to be giving because. What I said in my review is that Nino Cipri's writing was okay, and uh, I like their, their world building, uh, but the characterization is the weakest at, like aspect of that whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, for a little, little bit of a tangent, but question about the different roles between Nebula and Hugo. Hugo's are yeah. nominated and voted on by members of Worldcon, so specifically people who are interested in attending Worldcon or supporting Worldcon. The Nebula Awards are nominated and voted on by um, science fiction fantasy writers of America, the, the CIFWA. So it's uh, the pr professionals. I tend to think of the Nebula Awards as like being nominated and voted on by peers, <laughs> uh, by other authors and, and industry professionals and stuff. So it's really interesting when they overlap, but also very interesting when they don't overlap. I feel, okay, so I think comparing the Nebulas to the Golden Globes and the Hugos to the Oscars is a disservice to the Nebulas because the Golden Glo Globes are crap. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so if you're if you're voting in for the Nebulas, you're probably a publisher, you're an editor, you're a writer. Um, some, like, professional reviewers are involved in that, I know. Um, so it's a, just a very different take. Maybe Thomas can tell us in the chat because I'm pretty sure Thomas has, has been a CIFWA affiliate and had voting rights in the past. So he might know who who's eligible for that. For that um, I mean, I mean, I, I love I love Angela's um, oh Andreas Andreas comment. I might um, be getting tipsy. Uh, yeah. That Nebula is like the Golden Globes and Hugo Awards is like the Oscars. Uh, maybe. 
but none of us has the Oscars money. Yeah, no, I would, I would, so here, I would say the Nebulas are more of like the SAG AFTRA awards or like one of like the professional association awards, whereas the Hugos are more of the Oscars or more of like the Critics' Choice Awards. So I think yeah. like there's not like a good an analogy to it, but like I said, I think comparing the Hugos to the Golden Globes is a disservice to the Nebula or the Nebulas to the Golden Globes is a disservice to the Nebulas. Yeah. And the difference with the, I mean, the Hugo membership is pretty a low bar for entry. I mean, you have to have the 50 bucks for a supporting membership, which is not no bar. That's a big bar for a lot of people, but it is. Also, also when we talk about like um, awards eligibility and stuff, um, it is, it is true that like uh, Oscars and Hugos both require a membership, but the nominees are not actively lobbying and spending wine and dine money to get themselves on the shortlist. I mean, they could, if anyone wanted I... to take me out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would not I, say no. It might be a very cheap date. A very cheap <laughs> And I'm not it's afraid always to been a very it. cheap date. It's my selling point when I was Look, I just want to go to a nice brew pub and not have to pay. <laughs> let's let's drink and then move on to the next category. Novelette. So the novelette nominees are Burn or the Episodic Life of Sam Wells as a Super by A.T. Greenblatt. Helicopter Story by Isabel Fall. The Inaccessibility of Heaven by Alieta de Borard. Monster by Naomi Kritzer, The Pill by Meg Ellison, and Two Truths and a Lie by Sarah Pinsker. I think a lot of people are going to comment on Helicopter Story. Mm -hmm. um, I don't personally remember a lot of what the discussion was about that back last year, I think. Um, it was pre-pandemic. It was early 2020. And that might be why yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> it's been a long time since well, then. Well, the um, thing <laughs> about the naming the naming of the uh, novelette. Uh, wait, are we? Yeah, yeah, the the name of the no novelette is different than what it was originally published, and I think that might have been at the request of the author. Uh, yeah, because the thing that happens happened was that when it was published, I Isabel Fall wasn't publicly out as a uh, transgender author, and because of the backlash uh, they received, uh, because Clarksworld published this. Uh, novelette, they had to come out and apologize and explain what they had thought of, what their thought process was uh, behind the uh, uh, title and behind the story. And then it was, uh, it was first pulled from Clark's World and then it was republished under a different name. I didn't remember what it's worth, list. Claire, you don't have to take me out. I will take you out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I, I actually read the original version or whatever of Helicopter Story because I had the magazine before things got changed. Um, I don't really have thoughts on it, though. It's been such a long time since I read it. So um, I don't actually have thoughts on anything in this category because I don't think yeah, I read. I don't have any thoughts. I haven't um, read any of these or the short stories yet, so I just have to sit out these two categories, I think. Yeah. According to Shannon, though, uh, the Greenblatt novelette um is apparently really worth getting to so it's un in uncanny so that means you should be able to read it for free online if you care to do so so um in fact most of the novelettes and all of the short stories which we'll talk about next um if you just google them you should be able to uh find them online right away um Oh, and in terms of finding, how does one find short stories and novelettes uh, outside of anthologies? I'm gonna plot, um, and Shannon had mentioned it, um, Lady Business, uh, namely Renee, does a Hugo spreadsheet, a Hugo like potential nomination spreadsheet every year. And it's a absolutely fantastic resource. Um, and so like, as people will read or watch things throughout the year, they are encouraged to put them on the spreadsheet so that other people can find them and then also you can remember stuff that you might have read and enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And they, they have already started the uh, spreadsheet for like next year's nomination mm -hmm. period. So it is that, one of uh, my favorite resources. For mm. Yep. But yeah, I have only read 
the helicopter story from these, and I read the unedited uh, original publish publication of the story. So I am probably going to read it again uh, because I expect that it got it went through edits before it was republished. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, Becca mentioned the Amazon Faraway collection. I haven't read any of them, but that's a good point. I kind of was surprised that that none of them made the the short list. That was the one where N.K. Jemison's story was in that one as well. Yeah, Emergency Skin, which mm -hmm. is phenomenal, by the way, if you haven't. I mean, it's read by um, <laughs> Jason Isaac, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Me, because I listened not... to it. I don't want to get anything on Audible, but that is so tempting. Bree, you I... are not making me repurchase my Audible membership. You are not doing that to me. We all know how I feel about Jeff Bezos, but I'm so addicted to Audible. I mean, I am addicted like to, to Jason Isaac. I won't notice my 20 bucks a month. Can I can I just plug Libro FM? Yeah, for I have Libro here? FM. <laughs> I really like it. Um, also, heads up for Libro FM for the weekend of Independent Bookstore Day. If you spend fifteen dollars at a qualifying I independent mean, bookstore and send them a receipt, they will give you a free ebook or a free audiobook. Damn. I am a poor student that is even cheaper than Libro FM, so I am gonna plug Scribd.com. Works yeah. on works on your uh, like uh, browser, and they also have an app. Don't favorite anything or add anything to your list, though, because that's a kind of a soft block uh, that they use to basically limit your um, accessibility to, to popular titles. I don't have any problems with uh, accessing titles because I, I just, you know, don't favorite anything. So I will just go and listen to stuff. But that's a tip from me to you. Um. And I, I can't confirm because I just looked it up. Jason Isaac does read Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemison. It's a four hour listen, which means it's perfect for an afternoon of doing chores, gardening or whatever. You I mean, you know, Brie. Um, yes. Since you, since you like, I know this isn't Hugo related, but it is audiobook related. When you are getting uh, the, the, the Wee Reeves, uh, you you have to um, uh, you have you have to read uh, the uh, get the fuck to sleep as read by Samuel L. Jackson uh, the <laughs> picture book. Fair, uh, very fair. <laughs> oh my! All right, short story. All right. Okay. The short story nominees are Badass Moms in the Zombie Apocalypse by Ray Carson, A Guide for Working Breeds by Vina Jimen Prasad, Little Free Library by Naomi Kritzer, The Mermaid Astronaut by Yoon Ha Lee, Metal Like Blood in the Dark by T. Kingfisher, and Open House on a Haunted Hill by John Wiswell. And all of these, a couple of these are published in like um, anthologies, but they are um, reprinted online if you want to Google them. Very excited for this list of authors. Looking forward to reading these stories. Yeah, I haven't read any of these stories, but I like these authors. Uh, from what I checked on Twitter before starting this live, I think John Wiswell at least is a first time nominee. Huh. And, and all of, all she's of the, the other side I've never read any of them before. Uh, mm -hmm. So I sat down and quickly read a couple of these before the live show because they were short. And a guide for working breeds is just a super cute robot story. I mean, just I think Does everything that gold? writes is golden. <laughs> a guide for working breeds sounds like something related to dogs. Are there good oh, it boys is. in it? <gasps> <laughs> Now I, my, my interest has been peaked. Like I said, it's cute. <laughs> so yeah, um, I had totally forgotten because I just didn't remember the title of it, but Little Free Library by Naomi Kritzer is one that I actually read and nominated myself. I'm so ashamed I didn't remember that. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> like just brain blip there. But it, it is a really, really cute story as well. Um, I still haven't read any of Kritzer's longer fiction, but her her short fiction has just been awesome, awesome over the years. So I mean, 
just based on the title, Badass Moms in the Zombie Apocalypse, even though I am very squeamish about zombies, that just sounds cool. It has zombies and childbirth. <laughs> wow. Now it doesn't sound so cool. And I'm only halfway through the, the Mermaid Astronaut by Yoon Ha Lee, but that appears to be kind of a Little Mermaid retelling with a science fiction <laughs> aspect to it. So pretty interesting. I mean, I mean, last year when River Solomon's third story um, got nominated, and that had a lot of like child, like gruesome birthing scenes, and I was already like, <laughs> my heart, I can't. I do think the one I'm looking forward to reading most, at least just from what I've heard and kind of curb curb appeal, I guess, is Open House on Haunted Hill. It also was nominated for Nebula. Mm. So mm. sounds sounds much good. And yes, for those of you in the chat, there are always many cats in this stream. Yeah. It it's a cat filled stream. Yeah, that's Leia who, in the background who's blending in with my couch. I'm so alone. I'm the only person here who doesn't have a cat. But you have an Ava, and an Ava is lovely. Yeah. She doesn't join me though. She usually That's just hangs out in the living room, so. Have, have a Tesla. Hello, Tesla. I can't get over how much he looks like a Studio Ghibli character. <laughs> his face and his... Especially his with face. whatever he just did with his mouth, that like... <laughs> yeah. he, he is yes. the... Um... My dog is a cat dog. <laughs> yes. I mean, Tesla is uh, like the spitting image of that one cat in... Uh, the cat returns the fat one. The Carrie Elwes cat or the big white one? No, the, the big, the, big cat. the Carrie Elwes cat in terms of uh, appearance, but the big fat fat one in terms of a personality. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have short stories. Best series, which we already were kind of talking about before. <laughs> series, um, I sort of have opinions on, I guess. I, I tentatively have opinions on because I think I've read at least one book in all of these series. I okay. want to know your opinion. I will I will read them and then Kelsey will give us her opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Dave Abad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty, The Interdependency by John Scalzi, the Lady Astronaut Universe by Mary Robinette Kowal, yay. The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells, October Day by Shauna McGuire, and The Poppy War by R.F. Kwong. Question, is this the second time October Day has been nominated in series? It's so. either the side, like Shauna McGuire has been nominated pretty much since the inception. I just never yeah. remember what the the rules are for like, when are you eligible to be nominated it's, again if you've been nominated before? So you can't be nominated the year after you've been nominated. So if you win, you're removed from consideration from others, that's in case like an ongoing series wins. And sure. you, so it's like every other year. Well, it was two as years as ago that October Day was nominated yeah. because I yeah. remember that I read the first book because it was nominated the, that okay. year. So yeah. I will say in terms of like, as someone who has read all the books and is currently like in an ongoing like podcast series with two other fans talking about it, the first two books are not super great. The third book is where it starts getting better and it also becomes increasingly serialized. Mm -hmm. So it becomes difficult for you to like jump on as the series progresses. So like the book that was just published in 2020 was like the 14th book and it is not a good starting point. Um, I would say you can read, I, I would say you could potentially read the third book without reading books one and two, but you would be missing some stuff. But yeah, books one and two are like, are not as good as the series later becomes. I, I am aware from, you know, reviews of the series that it does improve from the, the early books. Um, and like, I, I was aware of that when I picked up just the first book to read last time it was nominated. This is just what makes the series category sometimes so, so difficult when you have these long series and like the eligible 
works. Yeah, I think the reason people are nominating them are not something that anyone is ever going to catch up to. Um, but in terms of all of the books on this list, like the only series I'm all the way caught up on is Murderbot Diaries. And I wonder if we all think that Murderbot Diaries is a shoe in for the winner or? I don't know. Cause I, here's the thing. I, and I haven't read Network Effect yet cause 2020 was a shit show. Um, <laughs> but I do think that potentially the Devabot, I think the Devabot is like more of the long shot, but I think that I think Murderbot and Lady Astronaut are the two front runners. Just like looking at the list, I think the interdependency might be able to like squeak it out. But again, I think that's more of a long shot because I feel like people haven't really been talking about that series to the I, I, first book was nominated for a Hugo that was the Collapsing Empire, right? I and I it was nominated too. I feel you, like the interdependency series, like it has that reputation of a kind of downward spiral that the first one was good and then it kind of like didn't stick the landing. When I, had a I really wasn't like that impressed with the first book. I it. thought it was like accessible, readable, but like I was comparing it to the other best novel nominees that mm -hmm. year. It was like this doesn't hold up in terms of I read the inter interdependency books as just like really fun, like popcorn science fiction. Yeah. And, and I have to be where for Scalzi that. falls for me, regardless, is kind of popcorn. Yeah, yeah. and I think and from like M1 is kind of nominating him because like he's John Scalzi and he's someone that they know. Because like when you look at some of the other category, like when you look at the other vote like other nominees i don't know i just it it kind of feels the odd one out i mean i definitely think that it's either gonna be the murder book diaries the lady astronaut or the poppy war like those are the three for me like which i think are gonna be but, but then again the i might be two. the poppy i might be two. skewed i might be skewed on the poppy war thing though because like it's the whole like does this have like a lot of pull in the world con community or is this just my opinion because it's so hyped on booktube this is my thing where, about where about trilogy. Yeah. yeah because dave about trilogy is getting just massive rave reviews on booktube people love that series on booktube i was surprised to see it on this list because i As was i yeah so i i don't know i'm gonna be interested to see who gets this category? But Here's Davabod, the thing. Interdependency, and Poppy War, I think all three are now finished trilogy. Yeah, awesome. Those are the three that we're looking at like, this is done. This, is, is, this is the trilogy, this is the series. Um, and like of those, I think, like I've read the first book of all three and the only one I sort of want to continue with is the Poppy War, but also like, I don't know that I'm in the right mental emotional state to continue with the poppy war series even though i intended to continue with it when i read the first book because i know it's like the type of series that like it's out to hurt you <laughs> and i don't want to <laughs> i feel like out it of is all very of much these, out to hurt you i feel like out of all of these i am most likely going to read the dave about trilogy at some point like that is the one that has like the most interest like i've read the first murder book uh, novella and I want to read more of them but it's kind of like like Martha Wells is like I, I'm so sucked into the Raksurat like books <laughs> like like I feel like you either really like the Raksurat books or you really like murder but like those are the um, no no I have both of them I, I have to, both of them I do <laughs> yeah, I have to leave but before I do I just want to make, make a couple of quick comments about some of the categories we haven't gotten to yet um, in terms of the Lodestar, I think it is a fairly solid list. I don't think a deadly education should be there. I, it is, it was not marketed as YA. Um, I think I am really disappointed Novik accepted the nomination, to be yes. honest. Yes. And I, and I'm I mean, also not, I did not, I read the first like two chapters of the book and the prose is awful. Like it is. Can so we, can we just, can um, we just kind of like, I, like, I have to, like, I literally have to yeah. run off in like a minute. So just, um, so very excited for most of the Lodestar. And then the other thing, the other two things, one, 
uh, short form presentation, super happy about Shira, less happy about the Jedi because Dave Filoni should not be directing live action. It was the weakest episode of season two of The Mandalorian. And very excited that Nerds of a Feather and Lady Business got nominated for Best Fanzine. Um, but yeah, I will watch the rest of this later and I hope you all have a good rest of the discussion. Have a good one, Di. Yep. Bye. Bye. I just I just wanted to ask like if we are already like in the like dissing Naomi Novik vibe, like can we just skip ahead to the let's, load star and talk about it? Star. Okay, yeah. And the and the um, let me find <laughs> I feel like me and Kelsey have thoughts. Yeah, okay, okay. So the the um the Lodestar Award for Best Young Adult Book, which, by the way, is not actually a Hugo Award. Um, it is the um, Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas, A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, A Lots Away by Darcy Little Badger, Legend Born by Tracy Dion, Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifueko, and A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by T. Kang Fisher. Go forth and speak. <laughs> I want to say, first of all, just off the top that I love this award. I love that we now have it. I have been generally really happy with the nomination lists for this award for the years that we've had it. There has been for all of the past three years now, something on that list that I've either, you know, nominated or read after it was nominated that I found that was like an absolute new favorite YA novel for me. It's been really great in that regard. So like, I, I don't want to come across as being like grumpy about the the load star, but right. uh, a deadly education is an adult novel. It should not have been on this list. Yeah. Um, I also, so I'm going to say another thing that I, I suspect Di would probably back me up on this. She could later come out and be like Bree's dumb and wrong, which would be totally fine. No. Um, I, I have heard and think that there is legitimate criticism to the idea that a lot of the Lodestar is voted on by adults. And so you get books and keep in mind, I love Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, but Kingfisher writes youth framed books for adults in a lot of ways. And that's mm -hmm. maybe not the end goal. I have been confused about this for a while with her T. Kingfisher like brand of books because I think when I first started following Ursula Vernon, she was really saying that the T. Kingfisher books were the adult books. And I feel like she stopped saying that. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously the books she's publishing, the people who are reading them are her adult fans. They are not. Yeah. I don't, I mean, people aren't finding those books, mm -hmm. but. It's, it's kind of the, like the she's been publishing Fisher, more things for yeah. her. The Kate Fisher pen name has become less about writing for adults. Like her, like she used to publish a lot of her like really dark fairy tale retellings under that name. But more and more it's become just what she self-publishes, the, the things that don't fit the traditional market and that she can't sell elsewhere. Um, which a Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking is a great example. Well, also, the traditionally book. published horror novels are under T. King Fisher, right? Mm -hmm. Possibly because it fits the darker persona more. Yeah. yeah it's um, more in common with what she originally would publish under that name. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. There's there's just... But with regards to the, the awards being nominated and voted on by a, adults for a, a young well, adult award, well, that is... That is kind of how all awards for children's literature happen. Yes. All awards for major awards for YA and children's literature are awarded by adults and they do not well, right. Right. Kids actually read. I think read. Part, of, part of what bugs me about it is specifically around, I think this science fiction fantasy fandom's approach to YA, which tends to be very much like, here's these 10 books I read in 1975 and you should love them. And so how much of that spills into some of the selection of these things. And for me, there's just maybe not the most modern mindset when going into the Lodestar. That being said, I've been very happy with a lot of the Lodestar nominees. Like over the last couple of years that we've had it, I think it's been a really phenomenal category and has opened up a lot of eyes. Mm. I, I just wonder how much of the voting population kind of takes that approach to it, 
which makes me wonder. It just, it makes me think about the award. I mean, well, yeah, and also I, I think a, a lot of, I may be totally wrong. I, I don't claim to have my finger on the pulse of anything whatsoever, but in terms of people nominating for the Lodestar, I think there's a lot of a lot of a sense around the world con and Hugo nomination process of like I'm no nominating the things I loved that were good for me. And if the people nominating are nominating YA titles that were good for them as adult readers, that's not necessarily the same as thinking, well, this is a book I would recommend to my teenage, you know. Well, it's, yeah. it kind of depends, yeah. like, what is the impetus for people to vote on a category? For example, like, I nominated Cemetery Boys, which, even though I liked it, hasn't been my ultimate favorite thing, but I nominated it because I feel like it has such a huge impact for its potential demographic, which is, like, transgender teens, which is the, like, main target audience for it. Um, uh, and Elatsoi, which I really, really like and was my favorite, the same thing sort of happens there is that it has the potential for like, uh, if it reaches its like intended target audience, which is indigenous teens, is like the impact of representation is huge. I feel like, n I also nominated Elatsoi and I, I feel like nothing like that existed when I was a teenager. And no, it, it didn't. Be so great if it had. Also, I, I, I just, sorry. No, it's okay. I was going to say, I really liked Alatsue, and I think it's the first time in a long time I've read a story about a teen who is having some sort of, like, magic or supernatural thing, and their parents just believe them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, for oh, me, yeah. was They're supportive, and they, they help. Yeah. Yes. Um, that being said, so... Uh, Thomas points out that the nebulas make an effort to incorporate actual teams into the panels and to the voting in the Nortons, um, which uh, kind of building off that Claire also mentions, which is a like a really good point, is that the membership prices are just too high for young adults. If I were 16, I would never have been able to afford a $50. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, the, and the membership for like, because you have the like I think you have a child membership, but even that is like uh, you ca you kind of like have this thing like are your parents gonna be purchasing that for you, or are are the young adults that are in attendance just kids of other world con attendees? So that's also like the pool is a little restricted. That said, uh, uh, like piggybacking off what we talked about earlier. Um, about the like all the other children's awards being nominated by adults, I think there's a difference in some awards which are, for example, nominated by youth librarians who are constantly uh, getting data from actual mm -hmm. actual library users uh, of what books are being like taken out and stuff. And sorry if I opened a wormhole. This is one of my like personal pet peeves is the way that we as science fiction kind of try to shove the, <laughs> my personal pet peeve is how we try to shove the canon. So it quote unquote down teenagers throats when I have a lot of feelings about that. <laughs> I mean, also like, I, I just generally like, maybe, maybe it's because I'm old and crotchety. Um, uh, and uh, so, I I have grown up in that generation uh, where young adult wasn't really a thing. Like you basically jumped straight from children's books to adult. There wasn't like that that transitional demographic just wasn't there in the same way. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's really interesting. I'm have high hopes for lots of way. Um, I also was, I was a big fan of A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. I wouldn't be surprised if that took it home. We'll have to see. I mean, I'm looking forward to reading a lot of this list, except for A Deadly Education, um, oh, which left it, so. I uh, DNF'd it yeah. at 7%. Okay, I, I did, I, huh, go ahead. I said this when we were talking earlier, but to, to say it, for the the group, I went to the um, 
reading that Naomi Novik did for uh, uh, where she read a bit of A Deadly Education at, I think it was Dublin World Con. Um, and I was remembering since we talked earlier that the way she talked about the book was that she wrote it uh, thinking that she was writing um, a YA book and then her publisher said, no, this is an adult title and here's why we think it's an adult title. Um, so like at the time she was clearly aware that it was, it was being published as an adult title. Um, and I think the reasoning behind that, which I'm, I, this is now a while ago that I'm scrounging my memory for something that I didn't take notes on, but I think she said that it was, um, that the, the target audience for the book, even if it's about teenagers, the target audience is not teenagers. It is grown up people who grew up with magic school stories and want commentary on the books they grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I haven't read it because I didn't like what I heard in that reading and I decided I was just gonna give it a pass um, in terms of the quality of the writing, the style of the story, in terms of the fact that I'm not necessarily actively seeking magic school commentary books myself. Um, but uh, was I going anywhere with this train of thought? Um, yeah, she's clearly aware that she, it was published as an adult novel. And if I were her, I would have gracefully declined the nomination for a young adult award. Can we just total, complete and utter tangent? Um, there was a post on Twitter where somebody was saying that uh, Diane Duane, I think it was, was copying a lot of uh, a lot of magic school stuff from Harry Potter. And she commented back, she's like, I wrote these in the 1980s. <laughs> Sorry, total tangent, but it cracked me up. Oh my God, my, very similar to that. My favorite, my favorite is when people try to drag um, Wizards Hall by Jane Yolen for the same thing. Like, oh, you ripped off Harry Potter. And she's like, I wrote this like decades before Harry Potter. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rowling wrote about a magic school doesn't mean that she's like, you know, cornered the money. I mean, ever written the about worst her. witch <sighs> books. The worst witch books existed it just, prior it, to. Ugh. I think I got a good solid five minute chuckle out of reading that when I saw that post. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, Sometimes the audacity and confidence of people to make make a, a comment on that before doing a cursory Google search is mind blowing to me. Okay. All right, we've been doing this for a little over an hour. So do we want to kind of speed up and get through some of the down ballot categories? Yeah, or best video more? game, best video <laughs> game. Let's, well, we'll get there. Let's go back to best related work. Before I, before I forget where we were. <laughs> um, Han Zealand and Faya. Yeah, I, my question is what is, so Faya Con, like I think it's actually pretty cool that some like, you know, the fringe con and an actual convention got nominated in this category, but for people who didn't attend Faya Con, how do you vote on it now? Like what are they, what sort of experience are they going to give to people who are trying to vote in the future? Because I'm pretty sure they did they there. archive some of their panels or something? Because that would yeah, be they like did. the best yeah. thing. They, they archived, they archived their entire Discord and also uh, some of the panels for uh, future use. Hmm. Yeah, those would be, that would be the way that I would say you have to do that. I mean, Fringe has the benefit of being real easy to find on YouTube. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can find also, it on basically all the channels. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think Firecon was also like the same, same with Nerds of a Feather publishing transcripts of uh, fringe um, content. Uh, I think Firecon has done the same, like they, they, if they have not already published it, I do know that they had transcriptions of, material from the convention. Uh, um, 
Shannon Depends points on out whether the uh, the participants of each panel agreed to have uh, the content publicized. Yeah, Shannon points out that it's not clear yet if uh, FiaCon will be giving access to those videos or transcripts, like to people who weren't at the con. Um, but we'll just have to see, I guess. Yeah, we'll see what they decide. The other nominees in best related work were Beowulf, a new translation by Mar Maria Devana Headley. I um, can it's to read that. <laughs> George I mean, R. R. Martin, can you just... fuck off into the sun or the 2020 Hugo Award ceremony rage blog edition by Natalie Lors, which was a fantastic read. And I can't believe I just said an F bomb finally on my channel. Um, <laughs> a handful of earth, a handful of sky, the world of Octavia E. Butler by Linnell George. And The Last BronyCon, A Fandom Autopsy by Jenny Nicholson, which I have never heard of. Does anybody know what that is? I yes. know, and it's actually a really interesting video. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's wild. Um. <laughs> also, The Beowulf, A New Translation. I mean, it uses words like bro. I, oh, I does mean, it? Oh my god, yeah, I have to read that now. <laughs> it's, it's, a a, it's a very like contemporary language. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just very not, not rhyme sets and kind of oh, like that's inspired interesting. by because rap. I, figured, I saw that and I was like, oh, it must be like in the vein of like a Robert Fagel when he did uh, like the Iliad and Homer. And it was just a very like heavily annotated, like, well, oh my god, I, I will, this is I will an have update. to show no, it's like it, it's meant to. It, it's meant to be a very. Um, it's a little. I'm, I'm going to see if I can find it. How modern and and edgy this translation has been, but it gets people wanting to read Beowulf, which Crap, like I could be convinced to <laughs> pick up a translation of okay. Beowulf because this one looks cool. <laughs> I have a quote. Way vernacular. I love it. I have a quote. Bro, tell me we still know how to speak of kings. In the old days, everyone knew what men were. Brave, bold, glory bound. Only stories now, but I'll sound the spear dance song hoarded for hungry times. Bro. I gotta read that now. Yeah. I mean, I've actually read what's, what's the really famous Beowulf translation that everybody mentions. Uh, I don't know them. to hand, but we should read it together. Yes. Here is another one. Meanwhile, Beowulf gave zero shits. He dressed himself in glittering gear, his mail shirt finely forged, links locked and loaded. Yeah, no, we need to read this together. Yes. De declaring oh, no. it so. <laughs> Maybe um, I'll do it. Maybe we should do a booktube wide reading of Bro Beowulf. Yes. <laughs> I know, oh my gosh. I mean, Quet is like, how do, like, it's like, I mean, I, I do like, like modern translation. I mean, I, I've read Beowulf in Finnish, like the Finnish translation of the uh, Danish text, uh, okay. which itself was translated from old. Uh, was it translated from Old Norse or Old English? I don't know. Not sure. Someone will. Someone will tell me. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Can we use hashtag Grow Wolf as our hashtag? Yes. <laughs> I'm stealing it from Thomas. Thomas, oh. it was too good. Check to see if somebody's taken the hashtag already. I'm looking oh, now. Boy. Okay. Best graphic story. Um, Die Volume 2, Split the Party by Kieran Gillen and Stephanie Hans and Clayton Cowles. Ghost Spider Volume 1, Dog Days Are Over by Shauna McGuire, Takeshi Miyazawa, and Rosie Kampa. Um, Invisible Kingdom Volume 2, Edge of Everything by G. Willow Wilson and Christian Ward. Monstrous Volume 5, War Child by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. Once in Future Volume 1, The King is Undead, written by Karen Gillan, illustrated by Dan Mora and some other people. <laughs> and Parable of the Sower, a graphic novel adaptation, written by Octavia Butler and adapted by Damien Duffy. My, 
my uh, premonition, is that the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I prophesize that Parable of the Sower is going to win this category. I'm kind of feeling like that too. I mean, just there's, I mean, so many people have been reading it this year. Um, I frankly didn't realize that the graphic novel version was eligible. Oh, hey, Claire is here. Hey, hey. hey Claire. Ah! Hi. Hello. Hello. Hello, lovely lady. Oh, sorry. I actually, I forgot to close the YouTube window, so that was weird. <laughs> I'm a profesh. Well, are you are you going to join us for the Bro Wolf read along? <laughs> Uh, yeah, why not? If we have until November. <laughs> Look, it's funny to, if we both have to wait until November to know, you know, um, who, who, who wins in the like booktube cage fight, um, then, you know, <laughs> we have the time, we might as well. I mean, yeah. I'm so happy. Rachel, I shrieked. <laughs> I'm I mean so excited. Me, me and Brie were basically doing our best interpretations of a banshee howl. I <laughs> yeah. think we only had one earbud in at the time. <laughs> well, that, that is good. Yeah, so now you only have one useless ear. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so, I can say I do think that Monstrous and the Marjorie Lou title will be split because you're going to split the Takata fans. Mm. So, mm. wait, I oh, mean, no, they're, they're the same thing. Oh, are they? What? what? Yes, yes, it's monstrous. It's both Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. Um, yeah. The one who split um, is Kieran Gillen has written two of these, Die and oh, Once yeah. in the Future, which I didn't, I've never heard well, of Once in the Future, so. Well, for um, me, personally, I am rooting for Die because it does some interesting things. That said, Die hasn't been my favorite. So, so. I mean, I, I opted to stop reading after the first one because I just felt like it wasn't really my thing. But then it's kind of about gaming, and I it was really I don't know good. About that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I thought it did some interesting thing. The first volume, I haven't read the second one yet, but I it just it felt really, really grim and also kind of like. <laughs> It was very one of those heavy. books where you finish to read it and you're like, "What is the actual story?" I'm a wee bit confused. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things in there that I was just like, "What?" Yeah. Well, the the but story essentially uh, boils down to that uh, actions in a game have unexpected consequences, and the uh, like. It is com it is commentating basically on this idea of expendable NPCs. And, uh, yeah, no, play I, your I mean, morality. I get the themes. I get the themes, and I think they're really interesting. And I agree with you. I think they do really good things, really interesting things with the idea of that kind of like, you know, Jumanji, we get sucked into a DD game, but, you know, actual consequences. I just think some of the <sighs> kind of like lore and stuff like that just feels a little bit. You know, I mean, kind of like, um, fair, what's it called? Paper Girls, right? You read Paper well, Girls, you're like, what is going on? I mean, and you understand fair, the themes of it, but... They yeah. had to, like, the author had to do, like, what, an eight-page eight expose explain, an explanation about intentions and lore, which is what, which is why uh, in the, in the uh, end of the first volume, which is... Like, you don't have to read it. It's kind of like additional material. But I'm also a, al always a little sketch, sketched out when an author feels the need to do yeah. that. Like, mm -hmm. can you please um, kind of... um, have the yeah. confidence in your story that it will stand on its own own little legs once you, once you take the training wheels off? That's something I've kind of noticed about Karen Gillan as an author. Because I, like, I really enjoyed The Wicked and the Divine. Mm. Kind of did similar things with that where it just felt like super high concept and very wordy and it try it was trying to explain so much it didn't always get on with the story you know um so that, I feel like that was kind of taken to the nth degree and die for me which is why i stopped reading it but mm -hmm. but claire mentioned paper girls which has been a nominee a couple of times in the past i believe in the category 
And that's Which one that I, I, I just really wanna, hate this. I kind of want to get back to it because I didn't really think it was all that much in like the first three volumes that I read. And yet people keep mentioning it to me now as it's progressed to like six volumes or something. And like it's I mean, really doing interesting things now. I like I have a personal like gripe against everything that is like just watch all the 75 episodes it, it gets good like i just like no like no i mean like, i agree with that i would say to the point that you made uh just before Ray, that like you know if you need to do an explainer if you need to like read a lot of like for me paper girls works because even when i don't understand the stuff I'm intrigued and interested and I want to keep going and I'm, you know, the, the, the cliffhangers and stuff pull me in. Now, what I noticed when I read them as they came out and then when I reread them all in a row before, I don't know, there were, I think before the last few goes, um, when I read them all in a row, that felt a lot more coherent and it made a lot more sense to me. And like, that's, a pretty obvious thing right like i think the same happens with a lot of other things but um maybe it's just not the best kind of the the the, the best suited to the medium i i'm i don't also, know it's it's also very beautiful and to me that's quite important but again on that your mileage may vary i do agree with you you shouldn't really have to you know it's like when um when like book 13 of the volkosigan saga was uh was a nominee and I read it and I was like, I hate everything about this. And people were like, oh, but it's a side character. You need to read all the other books. And I'm like, I'm that sure they're Captain, great. Captain Warp Patrol. Yeah. I, mean, no, it was so I also I also feel like <laughs> I there, it. It wasn't like bad. People I, just... should, I, I mean there there is also the fact that people are different and readers expect different things from media. So mm -hmm. I, I just feel like the uh, the response, like the knee-jerk response to a person who doesn't like your favorite thing is like, well, rather than diminishing their concerns about why they do not enjoy a certain thing, why don't you just um, recommend another of your favorites that might scratch a different itch, you know, like, like find common ground in some other way. <laughs> I, I just like I, I'm getting PTSD from the time people said I need to watch all the episodes of Inuyasha before I can have a negative opinion about it, and then I watched all of it out of spice, and I still didn't like Isn't it. That a definition of gatekeeping? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, mean a you know, question in the chat that I want us to to discuss, guys. Mm -hmm. um, Ilana Rose says, "I've never read graphic novels. Are any of the nominees a good place to start reading an entire new to me genre format?" Uh, none of these ones. If I'm oh, going to be Alana, honest. I will give you a list, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Invisible like, Kingdom is only on the second mm. volume. It's beautiful. I actually have it yeah. right But the thing I, is, like, is Invisible Kingdom a good place to start if you are completely new to graphic novels? I, I don't think it is. I personally think yes, because I think it's written very well, and I think that G. Willow Wilson knows how to leverage her artist's talent in conveying a lot of stuff. So it's not overly wordy. I just thought it was a perfect blend of the text, the dialogue, and the visuals. They convey so much within, within so, the medium. Yeah, I think my advice that I would give to Alana is that there's a lot of different types of graphic novels. So if you're somebody who really likes something like a slice of life story, these are probably not the best. Um, if you are somebody who really likes, you know, vivid, high sci-fi adventure, um, something like Invisible Kingdom would be, I think, really good. Um, um, go ahead, Claire. Sorry, Alana is a uh, classicist and um, I know that they wrote their, uh, their um, thesis on fallout i'm gonna say odyssey i was um, gonna say it's when you said super classicist. weird it's super weird but i think you will really like it alana it's by matt fraction illustrated by christian ward uh the colors are amazing it's like an it's the like odyssey in space <laughs> I it's mean, it's just an event weird. weird odyssey in space yeah, yeah. i'm yeah, going I mean, through I 
I am going to give a manga recommendation, which I think mm -hmm. will work for most readers. It is comedy. It is epic fantasy, and it gets a little dark, but at the heart of it, it is a comedy found family. And that is Delicious in Dungeon by Ryoko Kui, which is a cooking manga where a party of adventurers has to go to this dungeon in order to save a party member that fell in combat that they weren't able to resurrect. And because they run out of supplies and money, they have to eat monsters in the dungeon as they make their way down to the level where their party member died. I think, well, yes, Soren is back. Um, I think the hardest thing for a lot of people with graphic novels if, who aren't used to it is if you're looking at an ongoing work. So it might be better to start with something that's already finished. So Lock and Key is a little bit of a horror story, but it's very fantastical. Six uh, trades, which is what these little books are. Um, and then I always suggest Descender by... Um, by Jeff Lemire, and it is a fantastic Yeah, illustrated by just Dustin Wang. It's beautiful. And it's it's a sci-fi kind of found family-ish type mm. story, and it's all finished, so you don't have to worry about keeping up with it or anything like that. Mm. Also, um, um, if you want just, like, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna plug a Finnish favorite, uh, which is a webcomic, so if you don't have money, uh, you can read the whole thing online, which is uh, mm. Stand Still, Stay Silent, uh, which is a post-apocalyptic cosmic horror uh, taking place in a world where basically uh, a climate uh, change, climate catastrophe event has flooded every everywhere except the Nordics. Uh, and... Um, that Just so you awesome. know, Alana, because I see you in the chat, it's spelled O D Y hyphen C when you go to look it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> forgot to say that. Uh, that's important. Let's see. I've already packed all my graphic. I'm moving house, by the way. That's why I have cardboard everywhere. Um, so I I've already packed all my graphic novels. I can't look at them. Um. <laughs> More, more will come to mind. We want also, to go to the best dramatic presentation um, categories. I, I need to take a quick break, but I think, feel like you guys will have more to say about these than I will. <laughs> so I mean, quick, quick, we'll talk about long form and short form together, guys. Because I mean, I tried. I tried to nominate Jujutsu Kaisen. It didn't land because, mm -hmm. like, the world, the the Venn diagram between uh, weaves and Worldcon uh, members is apparently not a circle. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, the long form nominees are Birds of Prey, Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, The Old Guard, Palm Springs, Soul, and Tenet, and in short form, they're Doctor Who, Doctor Who, Doctor Who. <laughs> Fugitive of the Jadun, The Expan Expanse Galgamela, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Heart, Parts 1 and 2, The Mandalorian, Chapter 13, The Jedi, and The Mandalorian, Chapter 16, The Rescue, and then The Good Place, Whenever You Are Ready. And I will be back in a moment. Please continue without me. <laughs> yeah, so the first, the first thing that I will point out in case anybody doesn't know, because that's something that caused a lot of discussion in the chat when the Hugo announcement was happening is that Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, is a movie about Eurovision. It's not, in fact, the Eurovision Song Contest, which is totally SFF and metal as shit and should definitely count anyway, but it is, in fact, fiction. The um, movie it's, is a, it's a movie by Will Ferrell, guys. Like <laughs> On Netflix, it is mildly speculative. Like, I wouldn't categorize sci-fi or fantasy <laughs> as the primary genre for this film, but, like, I'm also, I don't feel like, you know, genre gatekeeping anything. Like, it's fantasy no, yeah. enough. I mean, um, the thing is, the rule is always that if it's, you know, if it's right. sci-fi-ish enough for people to it, nominate it, it for has a Hugo, then it counts, you know? twist, um, and it has a lot of fans in the SFF community. I thought it was... I mean, I'm, I'm going to uh, be pummeled in the streets for admitting this, but I'm just not the biggest fan of Will Ferrell. Oh yeah, no, he no. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, is that a controversial opinion? <laughs> I, I mean, everyone uses the elf gifts. I, I just oh, that's thought that he's it's popular. It's very recognizable. It's not because Will Ferrell is like some sort of phenomenal comedian. Mm -hmm. No, and I'm not also sure everyone watches the reason the anyone clearly likes this movie. Yeah. I think um, there are like other things about this movie other than him. I yeah. I will say, in keeping with prior years, especially with short form, I am very tired of almost every nominee. Um, I have not watched Shira, which I should, but I'm, I'm pretty. Pretty over Doctor Who and the contingency there. Go ahead. I mean, the nominated Shira episodes are the finale of the final season, right? I think so. Yeah, and same ah. with the good place, right? I am not ready to binge all of that just to like be able to vote. I'm not ready. Damn it. Oh. I mean, I have not seen. I take it back. Stinky cat breath, sorry. Oh. I mean, um, Brie, I've not I'm seen... Gonna... Sorry, I've not seen Doctor Who or The Expense, but I've seen all the other ones and I have to say, hard agree with Die. The Jedi is not like a great episode of The Mandalorian, like what? I don't even remember what episode that is. Oh, I haven't watched the, the second one. season yet. Okay. I haven't watched the second season yet. No spoilers, please. I mean, I, yeah, it's is not my favorite episode. It's my favorite Mandalorian. character because I haven't seen the other Star Wars things that she's in. Um, I mean, I out of all of these, I'm like, you know, The Expanse is uh, like a safe bet for any category because it's such a beloved series. Did it one, one win the last time? Was it? Did Mandalorian win last time, or did Expanse win? I'm not getting. What? What? Um, what? I don't know because I fell asleep during the seven. I mean, not. I'm just the being the involved. long form. Um, the long form. No, I'm. I'm know. really excited to watch the old guard. I, I like haven't the seen. Old guard. So true. Can anyone um, tell yeah. I would like the old guard? Because I've been very much on the fence about watching it because action movies are mm. generally not my thing. I've heard it, I've heard that it has a um, a good like uh, representation of um, like uh, a, like a gay couple. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. Uh, yeah. So are you um, muted, Rachel? By the way, Rachel, are you muted? Oh, oh not something. anymore. Okay. There good. we go. All right. I yeah, have uh, so, my microphone. Anyway, I have seen the I old guard. And yes, it does have a queer couple in it, and I really thought it was cute. There was a yeah, lot of I think it's so <laughs> I, I've not seen it, but I know like that the whole like premise is not a spoiler, like the whole central premise is they're all immortals. So like it's a queer couple and you see them die a bunch, but it's not gay tragedy because they're literal immortals. So yeah. I just. I mean, uh, I I've, I've seen a bunch of like uh, that I would consider like own voices reviews about the mm -hmm. queer representation in Old Guard. That's been fairly positive, so that's why um, I've been interested in watching it because I haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I am very surprised that Soul is on. Like everyone says that Pixar, Pixar is gonna make it on the list. I'm still uh, not sure why Soul is on the list. Because oh, um, I, just, I just think that nobody liked it. That's I, that's been I my idea it. of the whole thing. I, I liked it well enough. Um, I I know I've I've seen some interesting critiques of it that you know I think are totally valid. Um, but you know, in terms of of Pixar movies, it definitely does the Pixar movie thing. Yeah. Like some I, Pixar movies do the Pixar movie thing for you and like some of them don't and it, it, it's one that does. I, my hottest take on the long form and this is with the prefix that I really don't like Harley Quinn as a character because I have a lot of issues with the character overall and I could go on for hours. Um, I do think that it is one of the best DC movies for feeling like a comic book movie. And so when I watched it, 
I was like, I'm expecting boing noises and like things to explode silly. And that was kind of fun for me. I'm I like, mean, I want to say I'm like a little upset that the, well, I don't know what's eligible at what time because of when we get it in the UK, but like the DC Harley Quinn um, animated series, the TV show is so so good and like we are just not like we're so far behind i don't we don't mm -hmm. have it and like i'm sorry i have a full time i don't have time to pirate shit okay i'm not like 16 with dial-up internet anymore i'm not gonna spend <laughs> ages like give it to me on my netflix that i pay for i've got like netflix and, and I've got amazon i pay for so many services give me bloody Harley Quinn. I'm so annoyed. I mean, that is, um, yeah. I, I, have, I, have, I, have literally, <laughs> I have literally nothing to say about the long form and short form categories other than for next year's consideration. Please watch Wonder Egg Priority, everyone, so you can nominate it in, in the both the best short form in single episodes and uh, in, in, in the long form as the whole I mean, season, because it is amazing. Yeah, I, but I the, problem the problem with next year and... The problem with next year and dramatic presentation is that next year, like, all of the Marvel TV shit hits the eligibility criteria. WandaVision, yeah. Winter Soldier, and all that is going to be on. So, so you know, totally like, just yeah. let me have my weeb dream of seeing an anime show on the shortlist in the Hugo's. Raya, what you need to do if you want that to happen is you need to convince a bunch of weebs to, like, become Worldcon people. And you need to, like, I, bring them into the fandom. That's I, how you I do. Need to, I need to, like, do reconnaissance about what, what's the current state of the weeb Worldcon member Venn diagram so that I can weaponize the voter base. It sounds okay, like well, over the next not... year or two, you have work. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't, I don't want to do was that, in, in that in that previous yeah. thing, that, the thing that I'm not going to. Th I think we all, I think we all know you don't want to do that. I think <laughs> yeah. we trust you. <laughs> oh my. My only other thoughts on these two categories is Tenet. I am not surprised in the slightest made it, but um, I'm like so meh on it. Like, no, it doesn't make any mm. sense. I haven't it's seen a it. On a movie. I haven't seen it and I haven't heard amazing things about it from people I mean, who are far more into movies than I am. I mean, I'm going to have a controversial opinion that now that Satoshi Kon has been dead for many years, I mean, Aronofsky and Nolan just don't have any material to pull from anymore. So that that's why their movies don't make any sense anymore. I don't know. Cast some of that shade a little farther, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support your shade, even though I don't understand it. What I'm going to say is, I listened to Over Invested and I trust uh, Gav and uh, um, I trust Morgan and Gav. Sorry, I was like, what's Morgan? I mean, um, Claire. And I basically, they hated it. So, you know, I'm, and they said it made no sense. And they I are mean, Nolan fans. So. Claire, you, you will understand my shade if you watch Black Swan and then you watch Perfect Blue. Uh, by Satoshi Kon. No, because they are basically the same movie. No, that, that, I mean, look, I, I I get what you were saying. I'm just saying I don't I don't get the reference. I understood like the implication, but that is so I, not my I, type of film. <laughs> like immediately Black Swan, I'm like, eh, no, that sounds like too much. Uh, that not is, just, it it's is. not the horror. It's not the horror. It's just just the the, the drama of like hyper competitive dust blah 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 if it doesn't have like you know musical numbers alongside the dancing i'm like, mm. <laughs> i will i will stand for the 90s like competitive ballerina teen movies though that's about yeah. the, the level of dance movie that i'm into exactly <laughs> like, I, mean, exactly. I like that kind of stuff when i was actually taking ballet and i was 11 i don't care anymore <laughs> <laughs> ballet i'm like look Teenage yes, dance I movies or dance moms or bust. 
I took ballet for two years and I have a black belt in Taekwondo. And it, yes, at one point I was super into like Taekwondo martial arts movies as well, but also I was like 12. I mean, yeah. Rachel, have you seen the K Tigers YouTube channel where they make like Taekwondo ta dance covers of K-pop songs? <laughs> no, I did not know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to link it to you because you, you have yeah, an appreciation. Erin, um, oh, I was thinking of center stage exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is quiet. That, uh, that was just so peak right here and so perfect. That was beautiful. <laughs> I wish that I had actual good things to say about my martial arts career, but unfortunately, all the years I was involved in it, the uh, the dojo that I went to was basically just reeling from multiple um, terrible things happening with the owners, including sleeping ah. with underage students. And uh, I came away from the whole thing with this, like, everybody who I respected who <laughs> trained me was a terrible person. I don't have very fun. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I do have a black belt in Taekwondo. That, I mean, that that blows my mind maybe even more than the than the fact that you have, have like why 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 are all the good things suddenly laced with terribleness? Like why can't we have nice things? I don't know. Uh, ah. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Best video game. Best video okay. game. Do we have any thoughts on best editors? I haven't been following. Mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. any that I don't think there's anything best. surprising in best editor. I don't think mm -hmm. there's anything surprising in semi prosine. I don't think there's anything really surprising in most of the categories in that regard. I mean, I will say yay for like escape, escape pod and podcastle and fire. But I yeah. agree that it's not particularly surprising. I mean, I'm um, uncanny and strange horizon. Like, um, you know, I, I I hope Fire wins this year because I mean they've been, they've been doing such good stuff not only in terms of like publishing short stories but also in terms of like building community, um, yeah. especially like within uh, Black SFF fan fans. Like it's like. I, I just feel like if you if you look at in terms of like quality of of the magazine, yeah, I mean, sure, but also like what is the legacy? Like I think that Fire is doing like really important things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should all check out art. The artists are always good. I never. Uh, the artists them. are always. They never disappoint. So uh, best best yeah. professional artist. Um, Tommy Arnold, who I do not know. Um, oh, Tommy Arnold, I, didn't he do Harrow the covers the for Harrow and Gideon? Yes, I think so. Okay. Unbroken. Um, um, the Unbroken. The Dora, Maurizio Manzieri, who I do know, uh, John Picasso, and Alyssa Winans. So, Ravina Kai's work is beautiful. Oh, Alyssa yes. Winans as well. I, I believe so Alyssa so Winans did the cover for uh, The Empress of Salt and Fortune. And yes. uh, the down the mountain. And, yeah, and it's, it's just kind of pretty. That's what I nominated for her. Absolutely. And uh, Ravina yeah. Kai did uh, the illustrations for Elatsui. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. John Picasso yes. did the. I, uh, I totally forgot that I brought physical books to hold up until we started talking about art. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, that's adorable. Uh, John John Picasso did the cover for Black Sun. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes. Really well, yeah. Kai also did Book of Dragons. Mm. I, was was reading, I was reading both of these during like cram time for the nominations. And mm -hmm. they both have both beautiful covers and internal illustrations. The uh, Alexa yeah. has these chapter headings. Mm -hmm. The, yeah. Also, the wonderful thing about the lots of chapter headings is that if you completely ignore the uh, written portion of the story and just look at the art, the art by itself is a completely self-contained story oh, from beginning cute. to end. Oh, like really? It a, yes, it is a continuous self-contained short story by itself. Mm, that's really yeah. cool. Book yes. of Dragons yeah. also has very cool internal illustrations stories. Oh, and so cool. It also has like this little dragon thing between stories. 
Oh, 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 there's a good page here. This one is for a poem. Oh, I love mm. me some negative space. Yeah. I mean, the only artist that I haven't personally seen anything by this, like, on the nomination, like, eligibility period are Gail and Dara and Maurizio Manzieri. Manzieri has done covers for Aliette de Borard. Um, he did the Tea Master and the Detective covers. Oh. Um, oh. Not, they're not eligible this year, but that's his that's his style. So, oh, so, yeah. so, so there's seven of the eligible this year, right? Yeah. Say that again, yeah. Kelsey? Seven of Infinities would be the one that's eligible yeah. this year, right? Yeah. yeah. Gail and Dara um, does... I don't know if if she does a lot of cover art, but she um, has a lot of artwork on magazine covers. I yeah. believe Uncanny uses her regularly. A lot. Yeah. If you know Uncanny's style, a lot of that is Gail and Dara. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, fan artist, or did you were going to say something, Bri? No, I wasn't going to say anything. Go ahead. Okay. Um, fan artist is um, Ian J. Clark. Cyan Daly, Sarah Felix, Grace P. Fong, Maya Hato, and Laya Rose. And Laya Rose is my favorite. She did the cover of No Man's Land. Nice. Oh, that's beautiful. I really love the cover of this so I mean, much. my favorite is Grace P. Fong. Like, I follow them on, like, in everything. And, like, her style is just, like, mwah, perfect. But... I also have to like give a nod out to Maya Hato because like the Finnish pride that a Finnish person is on the Hugo ballot. And Maya Hato did for for example did the 2017 Worldcon illustrate illustrations. Uh, so like if you are not familiar oh, yeah, with yeah, her yeah, style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's like her her um, style. Did she? Did they also do the? Um, did they also do the discon illustrations? Yeah, they did. Oh, they did all the discon pictures as well. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, in, it's in her art gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I I did not. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna have a relaxing glass of prosecco. All right. Uh, yeah. should, should I just let you guys loose on the best video game category? Best video game. Okay, I'm gonna sit here and drink. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> in best video game um, are Animal Crossing: New Horizons. Tell me how to pronounce this next one. Is it Blazeball or Blazeball? I think it's Ball? Blazeball. Yeah. Blazeball. Yeah, Blazeball. Um, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Hades. The Last of Us Part Two and Spirit Fairer. While you discuss, I'm going to go refresh my mead. Hey, this! Hey, this! Hey, this! <laughs> I'm really glad uh, Hades made the list. The hey, this is, is like it's super okay. gay. It's very it's well so written. It's so gay. It's so bi. It's so pansexual. Like <laughs> you can have, you you can have a, like a quintuplet like romantic and platonic interactions. Also, it is it is the greatest educational tool if you want to know about Greek myths. Like Supergiant Games really did their research. Like I know people have been audio booking Song of Achilles while they have been playing uh, Hades and crying wow. their eyes out because like I don't know how you would do that. It's such a fast paced game. I'm just like how I mean, do you even focus on something else? Um, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things on here I'm not surprised to see. I'm not particularly surprised to see uh, Animal Crossing, New Horizons, because a lot of people have been playing a lot of Animal it, Crossing yeah. during the pandemic. Um, and it's it's a very chill, relaxing, happy oh. game. Final Fantasy has a huge <sighs> fandom and yeah. a lot of different huge sub-fandoms, so it totally makes sense that a remake would be on here. Um, I'm really glad that Hades is on there and that there are things on there that are like smaller indie publishers um yeah. I, the I last of us part two is mm, i uneven, personally like but here's the thing i i haven't i haven't played last of us two enough to have mm. because of the whole you know i get yeah, 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 by yeah, zombies yeah. and stuff but like oh, i haven't i, I haven't 
played it I thought enough. you were going like, to say that the thing that happens at the beginning of the game, like, took you no, out. No, no, no. Uh, whatever. Like, I, 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 I don't the last care of us enough. Part two, I think the thing with The Last of Us Part 2 is that it undoes some of the interesting work that The Last of Us Part 1 did because it tries to like recontextualize some of the events of the first game. And you're like, no, the, the, the interesting thing is that you didn't really like know whether this, you know, uh, I don't know, whether the possibility of the zombie cure was a sure thing or not. Like, that's quite... Im anyway, without getting too much into the weeds and the spoilers and the story of Last of Us, I just think Part 2 was pretty uneven and there were some really interesting bits but like it was also super grim and relentless and not like I, I you just know I don't know it just it just kind of felt like they could have like there were so many ways that they could have told I thought the themes that they went for were really interesting me and John like talked about it a lot whilst he was playing it um we did a video series and i edited all of it so john was playing it and i got to like see everything that happened and, and see commentary um it's my partner um if i mean anyone doesn't know but like it's just it's it's so grim and they could have <laughs> i don't know i wish they would have told that story differently i so i watched Sorry. Okay, go go ahead, there Rhea. A, there is a question saying that how is Animal Crossing genre related, and I can explain because Animal Crossing you can time travel, and it actually I mean, has also, consequences if you time It's travel. a fantasy island with animals that can talk, like and yeah. Animals, <laughs> animals well, yes, can talk and also fantasy. animals who can talk, and also um, you are indebted to a raccoon, and and. Um, and, it's fantasy uh, you, because you can buy your you can buy a house and pay off your mortgage. <laughs> yes, yes, and also like you you uh, wish upon stars and then they crash land to earth and you I can just... build magical items. Like you have magic wands that do magical things. You have magical transformations. <laughs> and also, uh, you meet, also you can meet friends during lockdown. I mean, also, <laughs> the thing with this question, and I'm sure the person who asked in chat, like, you know, a lot of the time when people who are in Worldcon fandom specifically ask this question, not always, but a lot of the time, it's in mildly bad faith. And I'm not saying that's what the person in chat is doing because, you know, also maybe you don't know and you're genuinely asking a question. But a lot of the time you hear people saying, well, that's not really genre because it's not the bit of genre that they like. And often you get people who say like, oh, is this thing, you know, genre because it's for a demographic that's not necessarily them. It's not, yeah. you know, you get people sometimes the same kind of people who uh, get really mad if you don't like the thing that they like, who will say, well, it's a genre because it's not for me, you know? And it's I mean, like, uh, I don't know. I have a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to that question specifically because it is kind of gatekeepy, you know, just like I mean, intrinsically. I mean, but like I, also, I, I, I think for me it isn't fun. necessarily in bad faith because like the, the fantastical elements of Animal Crossing are... Mm. like it is definitely like a slice of life type of game so i understand that people may may look past the animal characters and be like well that's a slice of life game you know yeah yeah I'm going but to... also you have you have animals who who are your friends and i'm going to to derail and say i really enjoy the art and spirit fair and it was pretty see. and sometimes that was what i needed this quarantine <laughs> i've heard good things about that game i'm actually really excited oh I, I know that i know that i want to play that that looks so cool yeah you you build like yeah. this giant boat that you shuffle spirits from one side of existence to like beyond the river of the dead and there's like no real rush and things are basically pretty peaceful mm -hmm. and it's nice. Oh, it's is it a, oh, it's a build. I've now it's, Googled it and it looks very pretty. Is it like I a mean, city builder kind of? Kind of, yes, kind of, no. I mean, oh, Rachel, oh, you oh, saw oh, me oh. You saw me play the uh, Luna, the Shadow Dust during my live stream in like January, that point and click oh, game. 
yeah, spirit bearer is kind of similar in tone to that one. Hmm. So if you if you um, kind of liked the idea in that one, I think you might enjoy. Also, like if if you do not enjoy playing, I mean, I'm sure people have like let's plays of it. Yeah, that's then, that's really interesting. I'm just looking at the website, and it does look like there's some buildy elements, which is always cool. Like I don't know, I I always feel more uh, invested in a game if I can build a thing. Uh, right now, I, I'm obsessed with a with a like a tile laying game where you build like little cities and stuff. Um, that's kind of like Carcassonne, but more complicated. Um, but I like, it's it's it's. But I mean, obviously, that's a 2021 release. It's not on there. But like, yeah, it's 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 really, it's so exciting to have like something like Animal Crossing. I, actually, I don't know about baseball. I'd love if someone could talk about that if they know. I it, have but, like, no idea. I like I've seen it on Twitter. I have also like, seen it on no Twitter. And I have no clue. <laughs> the variety of types of games that are represented is great. Like when yeah. Ira was proposing this category. Um, at the business meeting, meeting a few years ago, a lot of the pushback that they got was from people saying, you know, games are too expensive and it's going to be only triple A titles because they have more marketing money. And, you know, if you people have to buy like six things that are like 60 pounds each or whatever, that's going to be really bad, which it would have been really bad. But it's really great to see that A, that's not what happened. And then you've got something like Final Fantasy, and The Last of Us Part Two, like those are both big games, and Animal Crossing, those are both big studio games that are completely different from each other. And then you have Hades and Blazeball and Spiritfarer that are much smaller studios, and like Team Hades. Yeah. And I think what like with something like Hades, like that was a case where there was a lot of word of mouth buzz around it because it had been in beta for a very long time and then when it released on switch like i heard about it through word of mouth i had followed someone who was doing the beta and then i had some friends who got it on switch when it came out and so like my interest in that game wasn't like because of the studio marketing or seeing it as like oh it's the next thing from like ea or ubisoft it was my like people that I knew whose opinions I trusted saying this game is amazing. I um, mean, I just love that. Uh, I mean, this is just me gushing about Hades all the time, but Hades is the little game that could, I mean, just think about it. They have their programmers doing voiceover acting in the game. Their composer is the voice actor for their main character. That's how like in house that whole game is being built. Mm. I will say we all know that my one true favorite game did not make the list, even though Bug Snacks was amazing. <laughs> oh Bug Snacks. I will tell John that you love Bug genre? Snacks and what you think for Bug Snacks and he yeah. will be so so happy. Yeah Bug Snacks is genre I haven't played it but like Anything that has like talking animals, I like classify as and like weird ass shit like that. I, I mean, it also, yeah, but like, it also, also has my weird, favorite character. And it's weird and kind of dark. It's weird. Also, it's I mean, kind of, it's definitely darker than I thought it would be. And there is a lovely super bro who is dating the mad scientist on the island and the mad scientist doesn't realize that they're dating. He just thinks he's unrequitedly in love with him. Oh <laughs> I mean, I promise you can, you can, you can all hold me, hold me accountable, but I will make a friggin' the book fits Twitch channel just to uh, stream the best video game nominees before before the <laughs> voting did, period. Yeah, I'm gonna stream them on YouTube though. Did did yeah, I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not gonna I'm just gonna, gonna stream them. I, I'm not gonna stream them on YouTube because I don't want Nintendo to flag my whole channel because of Animal Crossing content. Did no did they they uh, relax uh, they're going to have like playthroughs or something on the Discon 3 YouTube channel? Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so, Raya, Wikipedia. you should, um, Raya, you should email, uh, we should talk about that off stream because I'm, Nintendo have relaxed their rules about, about, um, about people putting content online. Like that's not going to be a problem. Okay. I looked up Blazeball on Wikipedia. 
-hmm. It doesn't have a really lovely summary or anything, but what it does yeah. say, it's an online, <laughs> it's an online baseball simulation horror game developed by the game band. No absurdist simulation. That's really interesting. Let's see what like. Well, no. it's on the best games of 2020 by Polygon. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it started last year. Polygon like sucks. What? Okay, I'm just I'm just literally googling it, uh, and telling you what comes up. I mean, I just uh, like sports and horror, and my my like. Eh. I mean, if you want to talk about sports and horror, the NCAA is a horror show. Um, <laughs> Dai's coming in with all of the good ones today. Uh, I see you. Yeah, I have a lot of opinions about the NCAA and how it is fundamentally unethical. And I say this as someone who works at a D1 uh, university <laughs> and who actually like, likes watching college basketball. The NCAA is deeply unethical and the stuff that they do to students could qualify as a horror story. Do they, by the yeah. way, do they still have the retro Hugos or are those axed? I don't know if no, they're actually happening. The retro, this year. Not happening the retro Hugos are only, the retro Hugos are only if it's in a, if it's like a multiple number of a year where there wasn't a Hugo or something, I'm pretty sure what's happening this year is that this year Discon is eligible to do a retro Hugo for an earlier year where there were Hugo awards, so they're not doing it. I think that's what it is, but then I don't recall and I don't know the year, so it's I, actually I don't I, that's I don't was, understand. I don't, I don't understand the retro Hugo logic in, in any way, so I. I'm glad we have a bit of a break from it. I mean, I know that some people love it. It's there for a reason. Like, they wouldn't have started the Retro Hugos if people didn't care. But I mm. just don't. Get I mean, it. I will say one thing about the Final Fantasy VII remake uh, is that uh, the cloud cross dressing scene is very lovingly made. And uh, the, the developers went all out. With bringing that uh, particular scene that does that maybe takes one hour in the original game to complete and and just like elevated it in all man all manner of ways. You you have like multiple different dress options for him now. <laughs> yeah, I haven't played that yet, but it's something that I'm interested in. But I would like to get a PS5 just because my poor PS4 is like. It's five I mean, years old, and I bought it like that. <laughs> I like I bought my PS4 refurbished, and it's our yeah. like I bought it five years ago. So like it is, it is time for me to upgrade. I mean, yeah. Diana, Forbidden West. Forbidden I know. West I wanna, is well, coming. well, the other thing is too is like, and this is not at all related to the Hugos, but the Mass Effect remaster is coming out next month, and, like, it will be fine on the PS4, but, like, I want the super pretty graphics and the super fast load times of a PS5. Mm -hmm. I mean, when my processor eventually gets here, uh, I mean, I ordered it four months ago, um, so, you know, chip shortage. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you um, can't get new computer parts for love nor money, and I think it's the same with the PS5, right? Like, yeah, yeah. The, like, trying to get a PS5 is a knife fight. It's like, they're... It's like, I'm sorry, do you not want £600? Well, so the thing is... Well, apparently like, not. Well, it's a short... Like, there's the shortage, yeah. and then... Yeah. Like, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the US, like, a lot of times scalpers will get there first. Yeah. Oh yeah, I am not actually like I'm not I'm not looking into that for myself personally because I work for a gaming company. So if we buy a PS5, the business will buy it and not from like a you know shady place I mean, because we have to pay taxes on it. So is it stupid? But can't you also deduct it from the taxes? Like um, a business expense thing. It I mean yeah. I don't it know depends. how taxes work. No, no, no. It's it's not quite a deduction. Like we don't pay the you know businesses in the UK won't. I don't know how it works elsewhere, but businesses in the UK won't pay don't pay VAT. So what we do is we buy the thing and then we claim the VAT back 
on it. Mm. So on something that expensive, 20% is a lot. Mm. And then you put it in your um, taxes as something that you've bought as, you know, like something over, to over use here. for your business. And then that factors in the calculation. I don't know how we have an accountant because... Over I, here, we like, uh, want to do the taxes ourselves and screw it up. <laughs> I mean, over over here is like it depends on your business model. Like, are you are you a sh like a shareholder company or or like a uh, what's the word like doi mini me the? No, I mean it depends on the company. It depends on so many things, and like the legislation is different in different countries. So, like, I don't. Yes, we do declare it on taxes, and it makes a difference. But I don't know the I mechanics. Mean, precisely. I, I am a I am a poor university student, so I I haven't had the privilege of being employed enough time to ever be able to deduct anything from my taxes. <laughs> All right, we've hit the two hour mark, guys. So are there any other categories we want to talk about? We haven't gone through- Astounding is um, Astounding. We award haven't actually talked list. about the rest of fan cast. And then um, oh. there's fan writer and also the Astounding Awards. So we want to talk about any of these? Oh, did you guys already talk about best related work? Yes. Uh, yes, yes we, we did. That's, I will that's go where back we... and watch that and have fun with it. That's that's where we decided that we are gonna do the bro wolf read along. Yeah, <laughs> as as I came in at the end of that. I just um I had to do some errands, and then when I came back, I like took out the live stream for a few minutes while I'm putting things away, and I missed it. Yeah. Um, so we'll come back to to, to bro wolf at some point because I think I want to read that now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that. So let's let's quickly go over the rest of the fan cast nominees because i realized we kind of just <laughs> forgot to talk about that at the beginning I mean, we, we just did the elephant in the room thing. yeah <laughs> we did a celebration just, but we didn't do a discussion yeah, yeah. Toast, yeah. toast to claire and rachel congratulations on the uh, nomination Sorry. for and, and also congratulations for Claire for the double nomination mm -hmm. in best related work. Thank you. Thank you very and much. Two for the price of one. Yes, and congratulations to our fellow nominees in this category who are Be the Serpent, which is presented by Alexander Rowland, Freya Marsk, and Jennifer Mace. Um, the Coot Street Podcast, which has been one of my favorites for years, <laughs> which is presented by Jonathan Strawn and Gary K. Wolf. Uh, the Skippy and Fanty Show, who are on BookTube now, for people who didn't know. And also um, our fourth, fourth time nominees now. This or something like that, yes, right. yep. And World Building from Masochist, presented by Rowena Miller, Marshall Ryan Maresca, and Cass Morris. And I'm not familiar with this one, but must so check it I out. believe that World Building from Masochist is a podcast by uh, some authors, like, creating stories in the show. I believe that's what it is. Um, I've heard about this one because I think Alex Rowland used to be on it, and they talked about it on Be the Serpent. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's what that is, but I need to check it out because I have never listened to it. And obviously, yeah, I heard. Title, though. Obviously, I've heard uh, the Skiffy and Fancy show and the Crew Street podcast, uh, and uh, and uh, Be the Serpent, and I'm extremely familiar with uh, Rachel's channel. <laughs> Uh, so there you go. Um, it's I, I not really enjoy Be the Serpent. I I really enjoy Be the Serpent. Like there's there's for me there's slight ups and downs in you know um, how much I enjoy what they do because like you know they they read stuff for specific episodes and so like if I'm not interested in the thing or if I want to read it later but I haven't yet then I'll skip. So I don't listen to every single episode, but I like a lot of what they do. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, again, like you were saying, like some of the other ones are, are nominees that have been around. So if any, if nothing else, because I'm obviously delighted um, A, to be a nominee and to have Rachel also as a nominee, that's amazing. But I'm also really happy to see like, another new nominee like you know because i think a lot of this is great work but i think it's fantastic yeah. to have two new nominees i'm second year be the serpent is third year skiffy and fancy show you were saying four-time nominee i don't know how many times the Street podcast has been nominated because it's been around a while 
Um, but yeah, because it's really great to see new nominees. Diana, you need to show Leia off. Oh. I need the chunk. Wow. This her, is Leia. Her she, neck. She, she is has the little neck sausage. I love her. <laughs> she is 14 pounds of, oh. of, of love and attitude. Mm -hmm. oh my goodness. She's uh, just like, like don't you fat shame me. I'm your general. <laughs> um, no, I, I say chunk with love. I've actually like haven't had oh, a chunky cat in a really long time. Like my last couple of cats were like very skinny, like Lucas. And so like I, I, I was not shaming, I was not throwing shade yeah. at you. I was throwing I was throwing shade the, at the people who were mean to carry. Yeah. Uh, we no need to be it. mean to fat cats. <laughs> I love my fat cat. Uh, uh, should we talk astounding awards and then wrap up? Yeah. Not yeah. Um, well, there's the best, best fan writer. Best, best fan writer, yeah. Oh, next. I'm, oh. Okay. I must apologize to because I haven't read anything from the fan writers, so Me I don't either. have any commentary. Yeah. Yeah. And, unless unless you go well, Alastair yeah. Stewart's and Paul Weaver's Twitter I'm familiar accounts. with Jason just because I've read his genre grapevine newsletter, so like, yeah. I, I do appreciate the work that he does. I haven't read... I'm familiar with Elsa in terms of her work as an editor, and I know she has a mm. nonfiction mm. Mem yeah. I believe, yeah. memoir coming out this year. But I haven't read any of her fan she's stuff. Done, she's done some good like articles and stuff. I've read um I've read a, some of her writing about um you know ableism. Um, she has a really um well I can't remember if it's an article that she had or something that she said on a French panel. But anyway, she's really interesting and obviously talks uh, about ableism a lot and and you know it's, it's a great perspective to to have. Jason mm -hmm. Sanford's newsletter, the grapevine, the genre grapevine is great. Um, I mean, Alistair. Alistair Stewart is a great writer and also one of my dearest friends. So, you know, <laughs> put also, out your biases. Um, I mean, also, Alastair Stewart's and Paul Weimer's Twitters are, you know, fun to yeah, follow. That's so. how I know them. <laughs> that's, that's how I know them. I don't know their I mean, writing. But I know their Twitter commentary. I mean, Paul Weimer writes for Nerds of a Feather, uh, and yeah. I've seen some of his work there. Uh, so, I mean, you know, obviously. I, I will also have to fully acknowledge that despite being uh, a reader, uh, I am very bad with, like, uh, written uh, media because of uh, executive dysfunction, which makes oh, it yeah. really hard to focus on written text, which is why I've watched Booktube. <laughs> Yeah, I will say one thing that is disappointing about this category that it is very white. And mm. I had been hoping that someone like Alice Brown oh, or Stitch. Stitch, I yeah. had nominated Stitch. I was really hoping that would get yeah, me on too. the short list. But so like I do think like there are good folks on this list, but I also wish that yeah. fan writers of color were more well known and acknowledged in this space. So I, I definitely think like that it like the ballot like overall the Hugo ballot has gotten better and more diverse, but this is like the this category in particular this year, it's pretty glaring. I mean it's it's kind of the same in like uh we were talking like we didn't mention it in the fan cast, but I'm I'm excited to see the fan cast long list because I just need to know if for example N Jerry from Onyx Pages has made it to the long list. Yeah. Um, they, uh, she, she is a guest of honor in Firecon this year, so I think mm. that will probably Ooh, awesome. kind of ele elevate yeah. her profile. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize Firecon had released a guest of honor for this year. I need to check it out. I really like um, that Firecon ha like is engaging with booktubers because last year they had Jesse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah. had uh, Chloe from Thistle and War Verse, and uh, we had Jerry, several. I mean, and Jerry uh, was a Noria. Wasn't Audrey? Uh, Audrey from Perpetual Pages, also one of their guests. Audrey, Audrey yeah. was a panelist, and Jerry was a panelist. Noria yeah, was yeah. a panelist. Um, Jesse hosted the uh, Ignite Awards, and Chloe and was also an Ignite Wars, nominee. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesse was an Ignite nominee. So I was thinking maybe Jesse might be. You know, I would be interested to see if Jesse was on the long list, just because you know I think a lot of the. I think but I mean, a lot I, of the question of whether booktubers make it onto the fan cast ballot is 
more of a question a more of a question of the overlap Venn diagram between mm. the two people and, and uh, yes. Worldcon people yes. than quality. Yeah. And I yeah. was hoping that Jesse being featured at FiCon might get, you know But I mean well, show I, people I feel like, how great they are. I, I feel like I said this sorry, Kelsey, go on, go on. Fine. No, go. I mean I, I feel like uh, I said this earlier when we were talking like uh uh, but like I think that the, it depends like how people view like what the niche of a certain booktuber is like for example for me Jesse leans more towards like commentary and contemporary and literary fiction even though they read a lot of SFF but like for me like they are generally like a multi-purpose lifestyle commentary channel not necessarily a full-on SFF channel if that makes sense Whereas I think yeah. like and Jerry and Noria are more like in the SFF sphere. Right. I, 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 get I, think, that. I think there's also um, the question of like who is actively, you know, engaged in like going to world cons. Like our mm -hmm. group that's been meeting up at world cons the past few years, like physically is is a very white group that and I, I've been aware of that for a while now and you know that's something that like I'm socially aware of is the fact that you know I'm there are these wonderful diverse creators in our community um and you know, world con isn't necessarily always the most open yes, welcoming see. space for them and you know you put it mildly yeah and um, so, you know, uh, the process will privilege people who feel safe going to world cons um, and feel that that's a socially welcoming space for them because this is the yeah. world con. Um, I mean, and I mean, there, there are so many I, different. I think yeah, that's an issue that sort of we as an SFF booktube community can improve on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I also, like, I think that Worldcon in general, like, I'm only speaking from my uh, experience living in a country that is not English speaking. And, um, like, Worldcon isn't always, like, even, even if you, like, you have the layer of race and stuff and sexuality and all that, but then you also have the level of n not being accessible and welcoming to people who are not from Anglophone countries. Uh, I mean, that's taken into consideration, for example, that World Con's ballots are always very Anglo-centric and Global North-centric, mm -hmm. uh, even though there are wonderful SFF uh, publications and uh, stuff being published all over the world and uh, even translated, but they are just not getting the traction. I mean, that is that is why we talk in that is why we that is why intersectionality is a thing that is talked about right because mm. it's so expensive to go to Worldcon. so you know someone like and jerry who's a lawyer i think probably could manage that but like then you know you need to get a visa to go to the us and so if you're not in you know, like there's so many different things, right? And even yes. when it's not in the US, wasn't there a thing where like the entire delegation from, um, I don't recall, there was an entire delegation coming from Africa that wasn't able to go to Dublin Worldcon. Yeah, I think it was the right? Nigerian, yeah. I think the it was Nigerian delegation, right? Because they, yeah. they were refused the visas. Yeah. And like, yes. it's just, I mean, like, and there, so there's many different things. It's just like there's also like other levels of accessibility. Like for example, I really hope that now that Discon has publicly said that they are doing a virtual tier as well as having the in-person convention, I hope that this is the first stepping stone to having that become like a regular practice in Worldcons so that you can have the virtual tier like it doesn't have to necessarily have all of the panels and stuff but you know to have that to have to basically have more like inclusivity 
um, in that regard, so that so that uh, to make it actually a world con, not mm -hmm. just a world con in name only. Yeah, and I, 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 I do want to like I do think that for a lot of the change, like there is going to have to be a drastic shift in like the old guards have to. Yeah, leave some way or another. Um, There's so just for a little bit of context, part of the issue is also, of course, in just like the practicality of the publishing rules. It has to be available in the UK and the US, which means that most of the books that are eligible, like just kind of fundamentally, are going to be books that are written in English, and yeah, so that's an additional like it's it's a structural barrier and. But it also means that, that, like, authors who pub, for example, there's the uh, 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 Danish author, Ryan Keith Yemi. Boo, Keith Boo, um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the last name without having it written in front of me, but he has self-published the English translations of his fantasy series, The Devil's Apprentice. Mm -hmm. And um, if, like, because he isn't traditionally published in the UK and the US, his work is not eligible to be nominated for a Hugo, even though it is publicly available um, in English and has been traditionally published in his original country. He has just self-published the uh, English translated version. Um, and yeah, Alana brings up a fantastic point about just like the physical barriers of yes, being somebody who's able-bodied versus not able-bodied and what that means for being able to travel and attend. There's a I whole mean, bunch of a whole I mean, bunch of stuff at play. I don't I don't personally talk about my own like um disability issues, but I will open up uh in a like semi way in a, in a sense that the your level of bodily ability is not set in stone so for example oh. me, my ability to attend uh, 2017 helsinki and 2019 dublin uh probably in my current physical state i wouldn't be able to participate in the same way because i would require uh some accessibility needs met that you know and like there there's just many things like like uh, that that's why it's almost a yearly evaluation well am i ready to jump through all of these hoops to attend so far i have because uh i value the um value the friendships and the 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 being able to hang out with friends and stuff uh but at the same time like it's uh it's an issue yeah, and that's another thing with like, you know, the um, Worldcon being in a, not just in a different city and a country, but with a different committee every time, you know, sometimes they're really good about accessibility and sometimes they're really not. And yeah. most of the time they're good about some stuff and bad about others. And then you don't know which bit is going to be. And it's just like. And you don't know <sighs> if the people planning thought through the location enough to know because that group might well, even be different from the people executing the planning on the ground. Yes. Like, it's and so you have no, Worldcon has literally no control over whether somebody's wheelchair is going to get wrecked by the airline and then they have to like do Twitter drama about it for weeks in order for yeah. the airline to pay attention, which mm -hmm. is a thing that happened last year. Yeah, where, yeah. Like, they had pictures of their wheelchair with a giant dent in it, and it's expensive. And they were just it's like, really no, we it fine. Like, <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, yeah no. it's it's also like then you have uh, legality issues not only in like different states in the U.S. but also if you take it internationally in different mm -hmm. countries. And like, like, for example, I know that in, in Finland, for example, you need to have certain levels of security per attendee amount. So you have to have one security official per every 100 persons. And the same goes for like having medics and stuff like that, up, like around. So yeah. like having to think of all of that as well is... I mean, it's a lot of work planning a con, you know, but that's why it's wild 
absolutely wild that we have to restart from scratch every time and all we have is the knowledge of people who have done it a bunch of times it's just like that I mean, makes no sense as a system yeah i mean finland has a lot of very good con running experience and it seems that even in our like smaller con running circles there there isn't like the so-called black book of like like previous knowledge around you just have to trust that some old person some old guard some person from the old guard will remember what to do and just no, i mean it's just not a common practice in the con running community at large um at least you know the specific type of sff con running because there's so many different you know uh, but yeah, in, in like US and UK con running, there's just not a practice of, of that kind of, and it's... Yeah. it's I think that's amazing. terrifying. I mean, my day job is literally documenting what people do and the idea that people who run conventions have never like actually written anything like, down or whatever. Please, like, oh please, my God. Yeah, the first thing you do when you start a project, have an internal wiki, please. Yeah. Well, and not even ha like, ha like, create like starting to document things and then having a set post-mortem where you discuss what happened discuss what went well what didn't go well and then how you'll change things or adjust later on and like brie was talking about in her excellent video I mean, uh, the way oh, yeah, so are, like the way the the con is constructed and just the bylaws and the legal stuff it's hard to do that um, yeah. I know we were talking about wrapping up. Did we want to talk about? <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. astounding award. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, me too. It's gonna, it's gonna yeah. be late. So, um, yeah, let's let's talk about the astounding award for best new writer. Um, the nominees in this category are Lindsay Ellis, Simon Jimenez, Micaiah Johnson, A.K. Larkwood, Jen Lyons, and Emily Tesh. I have not read any of these. <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling for A.K. Larkwood because I loved. Um, what did What did Larkwood write? The Unspoken. Uh, name. The Unspoken. Okay. Name. I I'm know. interested in Simon Jimenez and Mikhail Johnson's. Yeah, um, I do know words. Jin Jenny really loved the yeah. Space Between Worlds, which is what Mikhail Johnson wrote. Mm -hmm. I just won a Compton Crook Award as well, so mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it was it was a good book. Um, I had some slight issues with it, but it was written really well. I'm like really excited about whatever Johnson goes on to write in the future. Um, also, Jimenez, another one, um, The Vanished Birds. I actually kind of wondered if The Vanished Birds would show up on the Hugo list this year. Um, mm -hmm. Am I alone in the fact that this this book was not on my radar at all? And it, I had it wasn't on my radar either until no. um, my friend Paul read it, um, Paul from Commentary to Fantasy, and, and I was like, wow, I guess I should read that. Um, so yeah, it, it was really good, and I enjoyed it on audiobook. Um, I feel like uh, The Vanished Birds, I... I've seen it in the because uh, like I watch some like uh, lit litfic you booktubers, so sure. it, it's been on the literary fiction side of booktube. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely more literary SF in some. Yeah, I saw it, like, I saw it and as a actual Latinx authors to read instead of American. I saw it on like instead of American Dirt. I saw it on those. Oh lists. yeah 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 yeah. Um, so like I wasn't cover, so. I'm sure, but I can't. I can't place it. It's so funny because if you look up the the cover, Kelsey, like mm -hmm. I I googled the cover and it showed two different one, and one of them was like looked really generic and like hard sci-fi, you know, like blue and green with a spaceship. Uh, but then there's another one that's like a really vibrant black background with some mm -hmm. like yellow and orange, yeah, and pink yeah. and purple. Going on I'm and looking like that, at that now and the, and the 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 one that's that's just graphic design with no spaceship is the one that I've seen and so I like had no idea this oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean <laughs> there's a distinct like I never want to touch this I want to put this in my eyeballs distinction between the two for me <laughs> one of the what's, one of what's the AK? Seasons, not like the others. Was A.K. Lockwood the one who wrote the uh, Orc Priestess yeah. yes. thing? Yes, okay. it's so good and gay. 
there's oh, plenty of well, well, you have my interest. To read. The only author here I've read is Emily Tesh. I read Silver in the Wood. I liked it a lot. I'm still looking forward to reading Drowned Country. I haven't gotten to it, but I will now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I need to read her stuff. It's, it's I need to read Jen Lyons. Lyons. I've heard for Jen Lyons, the first book in that series is like kind of generic epic fantasy, but then like the later books, there's more subversion going on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I feel like when uh, when Lindsay Ellis uh, like first announced Axiom's End, I was really um, interested in it. And the more she has put her foot in her mouth, uh, the less interested I've become. But all the other uh, nominees on this list, I am interested in uh, seeking out their work. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I'm with Ray, like aside from Ellis, I think this is a really good list of folks. And I think a lot, I like the fact that there are a number of them in their first year of eligibility. Cause mm -hmm. I know in the past there have been some, uh, there have been like a number of nominees who are like in year two yeah. eligibility. So I think it's, a really good sign of like a lot of the new talent that's up yeah. and mm -hmm. I did I did try to read Axiom's End. It did not go well. I have <laughs> a copy. That little pause said so much. <laughs> your also your little eyebrow raise said so much. That's so interesting. I mean, I don't know, it just really didn't seem like, you know, and I mean, I've watched her videos for a really long time. So I was like, oh, that's intriguing that she's got like something that's, you know, it's it's like, it's in, it's intriguing to me that like the Venn diagram of these mm -hmm. two things that I like is kind of overlapping in that way. And I was interested in it. The cover art is really beautiful, but like the, yes. the, the pitch of it did not did not really well, excite so me. And also I want to say like, maybe this is an incredibly petty point, but like, I don't want to read a period piece set in like the 90s or the 2000s or whatever. Like, I don't need to feel old. Isn't it set like circa 2008 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. 2003 or something like okay. that. Yeah, like, no, yeah. I barely but also, know the but also like, <laughs> I'm, I'm also of the mind that just because something is in that, like, I, I am also in that, in that scene that if I like, like something and someone I like does a thing, like, I'm like, wee like interested but at the same time does that make them award worthy yeah yeah and i don't know i, I like, mean it could or it couldn't it doesn't discount them from being you know it's yeah. just like let's see when we read the book but like i've not heard a lot of people talking yeah, but, but about but it that's, that's the thing everything was, you know everything yeah. i've heard from the book has been like <laughs> like that has been the general consensus from what yeah, i've, I've not heard people much. Are, People either don't talk about it at all, or if they talk about it, it's like. I have a copy. Maybe I should give it a read, and I'll let you guys. <laughs> I will say I am sad because I'm looking back at who I nominate. I am sad that Lindsay Ellis is there instead of Sam Wagner because I loved A Natural Magic and their new book, um, like A Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry, sounds so good. Um, a Natural Magic is great, by the way. I highly recommend it. it does like I have a copy. Things. I've been meaning to read it forever. I really enjoyed it. Um, it does some really cool stuff with gender. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I am eagerly anticipating uh, the voter packet for this year, but also I might not be able to wait and uh, I will have to consult my library for all these titles, at yeah, least in I the actually, novel categories. I actually own a decent number of the novels um, in either physical form or ebook. So, like, I'm not super worried about that, but like, some of this, like, I don't own Scalzi's books. I don't own. There's there's I, stuff that I don't own. I went to put together but my I, physical TBR of things that I have on my shelves, and it's not that much. Yeah, I guess I have, I've just realized uh, that it is 9 30 for me, and I need to go make some okay. dinner. Um, I mean, yeah. it's it's eleven thirty for me, and I already got the knock knock that I should probably go. We should start wrapping up now. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, I need to. Yep. So everyone can get to bed. In my case, I need some food. So yeah, I yeah. need to make some lunch. Uh, lunch seems so far away. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for inviting me, even though I'm not part of the regular. Well, thank you for being lovely to have you. <laughs> thank you for thank you for having me again, even though I flounced out of everything because uh, 2020. 
I mean, I think that's a completely valid excuse because 2020 was a shit show. I mean, Absolutely. I think I think 2020 was the year that you either flaked out of everything for your mental health or you grudgingly held on to things for your mental health. Like, or it was both. A little bit of both. I'm in the yeah. second category. <laughs> I'm like firmly in the, like between two of them. Like there were some things that I like made sure I kept doing, but others I'm just like... I mean, I basically flaked out on all of my real life friends and have just hung on to my internet connections like, please, please. Um, okay. Okay, how do we want to wrap up? Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. Do we want to talk about like what we haven't read that's on the shortlist that we're looking forward to and then where we can find where they can find us. Yeah. Probably. Um I'm 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 so sorry. I'm gonna hijack and go first because I really I actually need to go oh, like yeah. now to yeah. cook some food. <laughs> um, uh, and also I'm I made a I made a video today to like give updates and say about the Hugos and I need to go put that live. So that's very exciting because I haven't done that in a while. Um so I'm kind of back on booktube after I've moved house um so that's really exciting got lots of projects planned um and i'm really excited to like read most of those books because to be honest after like mid 2020 i really haven't read much at all um so there's loads that i'm really excited to uh to check out um i'm especially excited to check out um to read ring shout and riot baby um, because I know they'll both be upsetting, but also fantastic. So, bye, Claire. Thanks for joining us, Claire. Bye. 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 Have a nice dinner. Thank you. Mm, I can go next. Um, so, I am probably most interested to read *The City We Became* by N.K. Jemisin because. I mean, I pre-ordered that thing and I still haven't gotten to it. So, you know, I, I need to do that. So also I'm interested in pretty much all of the short stories. So uh, that's also something that I'm going to prioritize. And uh, the next Stage and Bitch is going to be on my channel. Yes. And uh, it's going to be on the 25th, I think we agreed. Mm -hmm. Sunday, yeah. the 25th. So... Keep oh, that in mind. Ahead of time. <laughs> yes, for once ahead of time, Stitch and Beach on Sunday, twenty <laughs> fifth of April, on my channel. See you there. Yep. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to finally reading Network Effect, and then also finally reading Empress of Salt and Fortune. Um, and I'll probably I'm gonna be filming some stuff later this week now that I'm finally back in my place. So I'll be doing a belated March wrap up as well as the I spent five months at my grandparents and somehow came out with way too many books. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might be the title. <laughs> That's I love it. Great. I love it. Yep. Um Okay, I'm Brie, uh, as you guys know, because you've been sitting here. Um, I'm looking forward to probably reading through all of the Lone Star nominees that I haven't read yet. That's kind of the category that I've had my eye on for the last couple years. Um, and coming up this, hopefully this upcoming week, I should have a video on Black Sun and my thoughts about systemic class oppression in it. I'm looking forward to that. I am very <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> Um, Kelsey? Yeah, Kelsey? Yes, yeah, so I think I think what I'm most looking forward to finally getting to The City We Became and Black Sun, but I'm going to need to get my hands on a copy of Black Sun because I don't have it yet. Um, and also, I'm looking forward to catching up with the Lady Astronaut books because I've still only read book one. Um, and I, I meant to continue that series when I read the first one, and I did not. Um, and yes, also to the Lodestar list and also the Astounding list. Those are, are categories I want to prioritize because there's a lot I haven't read there. Yep. 
Well, I guess I'm last. And once again, we're on my channel, so you probably know who I am. But um, I think this will probably be the year that I finally read all of the uh, the Lodestar nominees. I always mean to do that, and I get derailed. So um, they're the ones that I haven't read, I, I definitely want to get around to, especially Cemetery Boys, because people keep raving about it to me. Um, and I will sit down and read all the short fiction. <laughs> I didn't nominate short fiction, but I will do my hardest to actually read it this year. So, bro, yep. wolf, bro. Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and Bro Wolf. <laughs> uh, Wolf like, we're all looking forward to Bro Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the, so okay. So we have been talking about having like a Stitch and Butch book where like we read it and we talk about it. So I actually think that Bro Wolf, like if it's included in our Hugo packet, that should be it. That should yes. be it. Absolutely. We should, we should find out if any of us have access to it by the time the next Stitch and Bitch rolls around in two weeks or so. We should we should uh, see if we can yes. finalize some plans and, and announce them then because other people may want to read it along with yeah. us. But yes. I, I, I do think that would be because considering how excited we are and Kelsey, you're more than more than welcome to join us for reading Bro Wolf. Yes. <laughs> Please, Kelsey, come join us for Bro Wolf. <laughs> So, I mean, it's such a long book, and because of its, like, prosiness and stuff, it might be a kind of slow read. So it would be interesting to have sort of talking points each stitch and pitch when we continue. Yeah, really yes. Good group read. Yeah. 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 Okay. We'll, we'll discuss it. We'll make plans. Yeah. Yes. So. All right. I think that is all for us. Rhea should go to bed soon. I need to eat something. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining us in the chat. This was fantastic. I'm so glad we were able to do this today. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you all. And we will be back in two weeks with uh, the next Stitch and Bitch. So, yeah, until then. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.